you can call this meeting of the CPDC to order. Quorum. Uh, for those of you waiting on the Johnson Woods, the applicant has requested to to reschedule uh, to continue until October. Let's see, um, October 29th. So that date's actually wrong. I don't know where he got that from. Our yeah. next meeting date is November 5th, November 5th, and we can continue them at 7:30. Okay. Like do they know it's November 5th? They do. <laughs> So can I get a motion to continue the Johnson Woods hearing to November 5th at 7.30? Uh, motion to continue the minor amendment PUD special permit for Johnson Woods to November 5th at 7.30. Is that right, Andrew? 7.30? Yes, that's okay. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Okay, or zero. Okay, that was that was the Johnson Wood stuff. So if you're here for that, that's continued. I should probably announce that again after we finish this one. Um, okay, so the first order of business is a public hearing for a definitive subdivision at 40 Grove Street. We have a public notice. Notice is hereby given that purse went to MGL Chapter 41, Section 81T, and Section 6.2.1 of the Reading Subdivision Regulations. The Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public meeting on Monday, October 1st, 2018, at 7.30 p.m. in the Selectmen's Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, to consider the application for a two-lot subdivision, definitive subdivision, submitted by David Orvush, for land located at 40 Grove Street, Assessor's Map 26, Lot 189 in Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Office in Town Hall, Monday through Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the meeting date. Okay. So, here for the applicant. Good evening. I'm Attorney Josh Latham here tonight for Mr. David Orbosch. Unfortunately, we have three scheduled travel plans from before we knew what our hearing date would be. Google Chance and the National. So we apologize if you can't be here tonight. Um, so, this is a proposal for a definitive subdivision plan to yield one additional house lot for the existing property at 40 Grocery in the Um Just by way of existing conditions, it's uh, a 57,640 square foot lot for the 167.13 linear feet of frontage. It's in the S15 zoning district and the aquifer protection overlay district. Uh, on the lot, there's an existing circa 1850s home that's not on the writing inventory. There's also a garage which is newer, it's not on the inventory. Um, the site is, is pretty well wooded and sloped. Um, so it's a nice site. There are several mature trees as you go back to the rear of the property. It conforms with zoning in every regard, except for front yard setback for the existing house, which is a non-conforming grandfather setback. So what Mr. Warbosch proposes is to do a subdivision to yield one additional house lot to the rear of this land. Uh, we can meet all conventional requirements under the, under the Reading subdivision regulations. That would include a 60-foot proposed right-of-way, 30 feet of pavement, sidewalks, etc. So we can conform with all zoning and subdivision rules and rights. However, for yielding one additional house lot, it just doesn't seem to make sense. It's not rational design to build a massive roadway to serve a house. So what we're proposing to do today is an alternative, lower impact design. Unfortunately, Reading doesn't have any way to do that other than through waivers in the subdivision review process. So what we are proposing are waivers that will allow us to do a good switch to Yep. So what we're proposing in the alternative would be waivers to allow a 40-foot right-of-way, within which we would build more like a shared driveway concept. Uh, it would be about 24 feet where it enters from Grove Street, um, splitting into two approximately 11 to 12 foot wide driveways. And really for the length of most of it to the rear lot, it's just a single 12 foot driveway, 11 foot driveway. It would be more what we call a country drainage. It would be full structural drainage requirements. Um, so the idea is that it just is much lower impact for the site. 
Well, what this accomplishes is ensures that we can maintain an existing 50-inch specimen beech tree, which is located on the property, which would otherwise have to come down under a conventional proposal. It ensures we can maintain a whole row of trees that you see that are marked across the entire edge here, uh, which are all six inches or greater in caliper. Uh, it allows us to build a larger buffer zone, what you see is called parcel A, down here, which is not a building walk. What that is, it's just meant to be really natural space for the rainfall. Uh, and just create more buffer with the abutter on that side. Uh, it allows us to do much lower impervious surface. Property with the outlook of protecting district and just general design standards, this makes a lot of sense. So, to do this again, we need to request several waivers, which are listed within our proposal in the application. Um, obviously, as you know, you can waive uh, any subdivision requirements if you find that it's within the public interest and does not derogate from the intent and purpose of the subdivision. I would posit that this really makes a lot of sense, and in fact, it does meet all the design intents and purposes of the subdivision control law, and really what this board's intentions are the rational law. With that, if I could turn it down slowly, he's going to talk to Thank you. For the record, my name is Jack Sullivan, owner of the Sullivan Engineering Group. I just want to add a few things to what Josh stated. Um, from an engineering perspective, we went out and located any tree six inches or greater on the property. Um, as we talk, and we're trying to retain basically all the trees on site. There's, um, every tree over six inches is shown. They line the perimeter. There's really not any mature trees in the area the proposed house would go. And by doing this type of driveway, you know, the, the grading's minimal. It's a 1% pitch on the driveway. And we're able to retain all, all the site trees. And, you know, some are large trees, 24 to 30 inch pines um, in this general area. Uh, so there's a good um, native tree buffering to the abutting properties. Um, as far as another important thing, is, as Josh stated, there's, there's one curb cut to 40 Grove Street now, the existing driveway will be eliminated. There'll still be one curb cut, um, not only for the existing house, but for the new house. But what we've done is it'll be 24 feet wide at the street. It'll be a common 24 foot wide apron. And then I'm putting a two foot wide crushed stone trench down the middle of the driveway, separating the two driveways. So uh, when you come into the driveway, it'll, it'll, it'll define the driveways more so. Um, so each owner will feel like they have, have their own driveway approach. Um, as far as utilities, um, we're providing domestic water and sewer to the new house to the rear of the property. Uh, we did have two DRT meetings for this project. We had one a while ago when it was more just a preliminary idea. We also came to this board a while back for an informal discussion on this development, but I know there's some new members since that time. We had a follow-up DRT a week or two ago with town staff, um, and we have had input from the fire department on this all along with conventionally you see some type of turnaround at the end to service a house. In this case, the fire department was okay with the driveway access as long as we provide a, um, a fire service to, the, to that house. So it will be fire protection for the new dwelling in the back, and there'll be a sized water, uh, in, uh, dedicated water line coming in from Grove Street to service this house. Um, I did do soil testing that was witnessed by the town engineering department um, in the area of the proposed rain garden and the area of the proposed dry well. This is all sand and gravels, Be beautiful soils, um, great perk rate. You know, so what we try to do is, I try to basically limit the amount of drainage infrastructure associated with this project since, um, and when I feed back to Josh, there will be a homeowners association for, for, the, for these two homes. Uh, this roadway will always remain private. That's one of the big concerns the town planning department had. That, and we did note on the plan that this will, this this roadway would forever be would be would be private. It's not going to be public. But what we try to do for drainage is the entire roof area of the new house will go out to a thousand gallon dry well surrounded with uh, two feet of crushed stone. As I mentioned before, there's a crushed stone infiltration trench running along this driveway, and the driveway is super elevated, meaning the high side's on this side, and it'll flow back to, to the trench area. In higher storm events, if, 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 these, if this trench cannot handle higher storm events, we have a trench drain out at Grove Street, 
that will collect water and it'll flow out to the rain garden. There'll be a riprap spreader at the entrance so if any sand or silt gets through it'll settle out into this um, this riprap area and then we go into a rain garden that will be it'll be a vegetated landscape feature but also provide drainage mitigation it's 18 to 24 inches deep and shallow and by doing that we're retaining some of the existing trees that exist in this area there'll be no trees cut in the area of, of the rain garden itself um, um, I know I did read through the engineering memo by the town engineer. He, he basically supported this concept as far as the drainage design. He was in support of the waivers uh, when we went through this. And just so the board knows, the, this right of way would exist on paper. That's how we create the frontage for this lot and back. Um, but you're basically waiving all, all the roadway construction standards, the vertical granite curve, the sight line, the full cul-de-sac, <coughs> sidewalks. Um, and and, and we, we think we have a, a good case for that, especially where we're in the aquifer protection district. We want to try to limit the amount of impervious area and, and the amount of land disturbance we do on the site. And with this design, we feel we do that. From the street, it'll just look like a conventional driveway. The proposed home is 290 feet off Grove Street, so it, it is a longer driveway, but that's, it, it, it's a little bit rare in, in Reading, but it, it, there's some other homes like that in town. And North Reading, Boxford, Andover, I like, do a lot of projects where you have some long driveways like this. Um, and that, that's basically it for me. I'm hoping to any questions the board might have as this moves forward. It's just to close the initial presentation with regards to ownership and management of the right of way. So, as, as Jack mentioned, the right of way is proposed to be a private road, a paper street, as you would call it. Um, the proposal is that each of the two lots would be uh, members of the homeowners association. They would maintain common responsibility to maintain the right of way as an open, natural, vegetated area. Each with the right to maintain their own driveways and uh, their own plowing, all services and utilities through those driveways. Trash collections proposed to be at Grove Street um, within the right of way area. Uh, mailboxes likewise would be on Grove Street. So it would really be treated again like a driveway rather than as a true road. Uh, we did submit the homeowners association and some proposed covenants uh, to cover all that as well. Again, we love your questions. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> questions from the board? Circulating in my mind is the fact that this is an S15 zoning, which also allows for things like uh, in-home care of children. Does the driveway accommodate turnaround for vehicles for that particular purpose, in case that is something that comes to floor? Um, Design-wise, it's essentially designed for a single family home. Mm -hmm. We could actually include it in the covenants that we maintain for use as a single family home. That's, that's not something we're opposed to at all. Yeah, but does that, that doesn't um, override the, uh, I can't even think of it right now, the Dover Amendment stuff, right? Section 3. The rest of use. So that would simply be, it wouldn't be a condition of the approval we could maintain as a covenant, because that would be a private covenant for the In fact, really, I think as the covenants are drafted, they do envision that each home shall only be used for a city of residential use. <coughs> Other questions? Can you just point out the lot for the back house? So, so the lot of the property lines, yeah. Yeah, just I'm going to have one point and I apologize. So lot one, which is the existing house lot, will come back to this point okay. all around here. Lot two is from here, all the way back, over here, over here, over here, around the bulb, and back. Okay, good. I just, I ask because I'm looking at another picture that looks like the whole side remain lot one, which, you know, I could anticipate a third house getting jammed into there and I think that probably would not work. And there's so, not enough area for that. Right. If you've divided the lots that way, it's not going to work. So, right. so I'm, I'm required at 15,000 square feet. So lot one's a little over 19, lot two's a little over 22. 
So the difference is only yeah. it is only eight to nine thousand square feet of excess area. There'd be no way to get a third lot. They couldn't do that no matter they what. They couldn't no matter what. Okay. If they could, they would have shown. Yeah, they would be doing a three-loss subdivision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes back to our proof plan. We proved with a 60-foot right away we could get two lots, and we wouldn't look to exceed it even if we could. And typically, whatever the proof plan shows is what what you do even with waivers or reductions. Okay. You shouldn't go for more. Mm -hmm. um, we tried, but you shouldn't. In addition, with subdivisions, I always put a condition in the decision. No further subdivision. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. The, um, the existing house on Grove Street is the in National Register uh, in this arrangement you're basically changing the entry if you will from the, the historic front of the house with the porch to you're, you're putting the frontage on the side which has the benefit of uh, bringing it into conformance with the uh, setbacks but was there any concern from the uh, historic people about logically reorienting the house no in fact the um, commission were very supportive um, they did appear last time we were there and spoke in support <coughs> they've been supportive the discussions yeah. okay and i also um i mean it looks like a good plan i'm in, I'm in favor of it i'm a little bit nervous about the uh, the covenant and the uh, agreement for the so-called common property <clears throat> i personally was involved in a uh, group real estate ownership that uh, i have video of my lawyer in the supreme court of new hampshire when things did not go well uh, so i hope that you have the appropriate provisions in the agreement to handle uh, disputes down the down the way and resolution you know, basically you need to be very clear as to uh, what the responsibilities and what the, the consequences are what the uh, procedures might be yeah, I believe we have been it's, it's a, a set of covenants and homeowners association we've used probably for about 20 plus years so it is well tested by the true it does include an arbitration provision to try to avoid this becoming a court type thing um, and really, especially for this type of subdivision, the, the common maintenance requirements are relatively simple and straightforward. It's maintaining your own driveway mm -hmm. and ensuring that the rain garden is simply you know, appropriately prepared. Um, we do, we do have language about maintaining the site distance along the road street, just about 15 feet back within that parcel, okay. just to ensure that for both our lot and the 48 road that there's some site distance. You know, they can be right. so really, that's, that's the extent of the common obligation. Well, just a reminder that yeah. the, uh, over the years, things can get less friendly. What are you proposing for fuel for the house? Gas or is it propane? We haven't thought that far yet. Do you have enough room to turn a truck around up there? I'd rather not have a fuel truck backing up. I know the fire department said they wouldn't mind backing up, but they're pretty good drivers. Right. I mean, we do have a turnaround here. That that's why we provide it's more for the homeowner but if that area wasn't occupied it'd be more to turn around and if it goes to we don't, i don't want people backing down the driveway either and it's too long of a run to back up okay so are there any restrictions on where say a propane tank could go we're not we're not near the wetlands right no there's no wetlands within 100 feet of any of the boundaries okay so the owner would be free to put in propane if they wanted to i don't think there's a restriction <clears throat> Okay. And you mentioned garbage would be picked up on Grove Street, right? Yes. That's a long run. Um, so I would suggest that our language includes that there's no shed at the bottom here that, that they keep their garbage in. They're going to have to deal with that. So we do have language that one of the major covenants is absolutely no structures within the right of way boundaries. So it's simply going to be driveways, utilities within the driveways, but we can't have fences, we can't have walls, we can't do structures. But really, that was a condition from engineering. The right of way truly remains an open and natural area. Okay. Um, that's all I had for this. No issue with lot shape on that, really, on that T 
tangent with the um, paper street, the bottom right there. Yeah. <coughs> Any issues with that? Lot shape. Is it relevant? It's part of the cul de sac. So usually the lot shape falls when we have a side lot line coming off like this. You don't want it over a certain angle. Up here, I, I don't think it applies there, but I defer to plan in case you concern. Okay. Um, She's looking at that. Any other comments? From the no. Comments from the public? Um, uh, you yeah. Just make sure you state your name and address so we can include it in the record and make sure that you've all signed in. Uh, yes, um, my name is Bruce Rupert Carr. I'm uh, the attorney for Two of Butters, uh, Sherry and Kirk Terry, and we're here with you now at 48 Grove Street. Um, and we'll probably do this thing. I'll sign in. And we just have a few things about this. We do appreciate the efforts that um, the applicants have gone to to try and you know, mitigate the potential problems with having a very large right of way here. I, we, we, I, I wish we'd had an opportunity to discuss this with them more before we got here today. We, for whatever reason, we just weren't able to connect. But we do have some serious concerns. Um, if I may, I'd just like to pass out um, this for you. Um, this is just uh, some of our comments on the waivers. And, um, I may not have enough for everybody here, but I'm pretty sure. If you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, but I just don't have a ring. You want to get off? I'll make sure you have <laughs> So, uh, what we're looking at here, first of all, is um, traffic is an issue here. And we know that among the waivers that the applicant has asked for is a waiver of the uh, traffic study. Uh, that's not something that we would be terribly willing to see waived as a butter, just because the traffic along here has been a little bit dicey. Now, you really can't see it from here. My clients live at this point. And there's a curve here and there's Mark Street here. Clearly, there's going to be more traffic involved if, this, if, if you're doubling the amount of houses that are being served by this driveway. Uh, also, if you have any of you had an opportunity to actually visit the site, because if you have, you'll see there's a lot of brush that pretty much grows right up to the street here. So my folks, when they're pulling out of their driveway, they're concerned about visibility. There's a telephone pole there. And we just don't think that this plan assures the sight lines, which we would like to see here. Uh, and I do note that the, the regulations do require sight lines, sight easements, and I don't see any provisions for anything like that here. Uh, there's also a telephone pole there, which we would very much like to see move. The problem with the telephone pole, which you can't see on this plan, is that it's located right at the corner of my client's lot and right next to their driveway. So when snow is getting plowed, it tends to build up around that telephone pole and it creates other visual problems. So for that reason, we really would like to see a traffic study or maybe a condition to the waiver that something be done here to assure that brush will be cut back. Because right now it's not a good situation between wintertime when there's snow and summertime when there's a lot of brush as far as the site lines go here. And I think if you visit the site, you'd all see what I'm talking about. Uh, the other thing here is they're looking for a waiver of the environmental impact report requirement. I don't know that there's any precedent for that, when you, even for a smaller subdivision. My clients have spent a fair amount of time researching this issue, and they can't see where that's ever been waived before. Uh, so we are reluctant to see that particular requirement waived. Maybe it should be mitigated or reduced somewhat. But I'm just not aware, we're not aware of precedent where the environmental impact report has been waived, even for such a small project as this. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any assurances that the utilities are going to be underground here, and maybe Mr. Latham can help me out with, with, with uh, replacement of utilities at this site. Uh, can you? Yes, certainly. Actually, two points. The sight lines, we do have a covenant with the homeowners association that has to be maintained 15 feet or three feet or lower, and that's an obligation of the homeowners to do that. Um, so that addresses the sight line, and then with regards to underground utilities, that is the plan for the project. And again, I'm not sure that that's the, the three feet is adequate. I mean, I would have to talk to my clients about that. I appreciate your efforts to try and ensure the sight lines. I guess my question comes down to whether or not there's a sight line covenant 
Um, if that covenant is not observed, who actually has the power to enforce that? Does the town have the power to enforce it? Do my clients have, as a butters have the power to enforce that? I don't know, but that's something which is very important to, to my people. Um, there was some talk about a homeowners association, which sounds like it would be a great idea to ensure that all this gets maintained appropriately. Um, I don't know that the homeowners association is going to make provisions for who for the maintenance of this. Um, uh, I don't recall what it's called here. There's a depression that's going to the rain garden. Um, but it seems to me that the homeowners association should address that in the in, in its documentation. So that not only are we preserving or maintaining these, these driveways, but also the rain garden, which is an important aspect of this project. You know, another thing that my um, my clients aren't terribly comfortable here with is with the lack of screening between what's going in here and their property next door. My clients are at a disadvantage because the way their property is configured, their driveway, um, and we have photographs if need be that might be helpful, but their driveway is very close to this property line. And so they don't have the luxury of putting in screening themselves, otherwise they would consider doing it. And in fact, they've tried doing so in the past, uh, but because of the, the lack of a whole lot of um, space here, they haven't been able to successfully grow anything. And um, you know, finally, we would like to see some curbing sidewalks in this area because curbing the sidewalks between the two driveways, between my client's driveway at 48 and the applicant's driveway at 40, would assure that there wouldn't be the growth of vegetation in that area, which we have now, uh, an asphalt, an, a an asphalt uh, sidewalk of some kind here with some curbing would offer some kind of a protection of that buffer, because really the sight lines here are terrible right now. And uh, that's really all I have to say at this point. Unless uh, Kirk, Sherry, is there anything that you're looking at? Is that covered? Okay. Thank you. And of course. You know, again, I don't want to, we're not here to make things difficult for the applicant. We think that they've really strived to come up with a good plan. Uh, but we'd like to try and work with them on some of these details, and unfortunately that opportunity didn't afford itself prior to today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, do you want a response? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to address one thing. I'll try to know what the, the existing utility pole, can you pan up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the abutter in question, this is the edge of the driveway, right? Yeah. And this is the property line. So it, it's a true statement that the driveway is extremely close to that property line. There's a utility pole right out here, right at the edge of the property. And the reason the utility pole is placed there is for a certain reason. They, when they run overhead wires to the homes, they want it at the lot line so there's no encroachment onto the private property. So if there, if there was, a, if this utility pole was relocated further towards our property, and then the, the utility lines ran over to this abutting house, it'd be encroachment, and the utility company won't allow that. So that's that's the reason why the pole is where it is. That that's where they want to place the poles. Um, we do show some of the, the, there is some vegetation between the properties. Um, I'll, I'll let Josh address that if, if there's a way to beef that up a little bit. But I just want to point out in the 15 foot area that we're gonna, we, we know there is some growth in there. There's no trees that would come out, but there is some shrub growth. We'd be looking to remove that. And the town standard is usually 15 to 20 feet back. Uh, vegetation fence lines and we're not going to have fence lines but vegetation cannot exceed three feet high because when you come out with a car that's that's the height you, you a, a driver needs to see you know either way on the road street we have sufficient sight distance and we really the existing driveways here that's coming out we're adding one driveway and it's really you know a maximum of probably two cars that would be added to this rear house I, 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 I don't see this in the traffic set for two additional vehicles on the road street but that's our opinion we'll show how those were in the discussion I'll turn it over to Josh to add anything if I could just add the homeowners association really is meant to address a lot of uh, Attorney Carl's concerns. Right? One, the brush sight lines, that's already included within the covenants, but that's an obligation to maintain that. Because if there is a proper sight line for both drivers. The second, that we can include in underground utilities so that that can be a condition to as well. 
And uh, the rain garden maintenance is also already a covenant included within the homeowners association requirements. Um, the sidewalk proposal kind of deviates from what the entire intent is here to try to reduce pervious, pervious area. And uh, we don't really think accomplish as much. The idea is to keep vegetation down, certainly we can accomplish that in ways without having to put pavement down. There doesn't seem to be any sidewalks on that side of the street for any length of the street, so I'm wondering why we would install a sidewalk there. Hi, Kurt Terrian, owner of 48th Road Street. Um, look, good question. So let me answer the other one first, around um, first uh, sight lines, uh, sight distances. Um, I, I heard Mr. Sullivan say, talk about the uh, edges speaking tall. However, it's not taking into consideration that there's already a firm that comes up three feet would actually block our view <laughs> still. So, um, and I'm not sure exactly how the requirements read under uh, the subdivision rules. I think it says something about a 20 foot easement and within their fences or nothing else can be planted. What we're suggesting is maybe on this side for access to the garden and so people can stand there safely before they go across the street because it's pretty nasty. Uh, try and get across that street at times the way cars come up and down is to have some section of uh, impervious um, material there so, growth, so there's no vegetation that grows up and that you can actually stand there maybe you can enjoy the garden um, my wife and I actually planted the garden uh, over there put the trees in and the plants we know that there aren't any um, uh, conifers in there it's all deciduous trees so when you uh, when the leaves fall off and plants uh, sort of die for the, for the winter, um, you can see right through right, right to the road. So one of the things we're asking is, hey, can we put some you know evergreen trees along there so that we can have uh, some screening in that area? And as far as the telephone pole is concerned, we have to pull out to the middle of the street right now in order to uh, in order to go south on Grove Street. Uh, it's pretty hairy. Um, when you're pulling out in the middle of the street and facing traffic coming at you. Uh, and that's the only way you can get out of the driveway, so you can get that telephone pole there. I'm not sure about right-of-ways or easements, but if an easement is created 20 feet back along that side, why can't the telephone pole go down there and the line go from the easement back to our house? It's really not going to change the angle of the, uh, the wire coming back to, uh, uh, to where it is right now. Thank you. I was actually going to ask you about <clears throat> what appears to be sort of a berm coming up and then back down to the grades you're proposing for the rain garden. You're probably going to have to regrade that edge anyways, right? Yes. It'll probably be lower. It'll be lower. By the way, that hedge regulation is probably the most violated regulation in town. I bet if I went to all of your homes, they're on corners, and you're violating it. <laughs> and I know because when I'm biking around, you can't see around those corners. Um, but if, if you're going to regrade it, this plan doesn't really show enough detail, I think, to see what grade we're at. Do you know what it is? What you're proposing? We're, we're looking to eliminate the scrub brush entirely. Uh, we're not yeah. looking to just cap it in three feet. We're going to eliminate it, open that area up. I'm just saying, if anything grew back in the future, it cannot exceed. Yeah, no, no. I think what, what's happening is that if you look at the street line, the edge of pavement, it slopes right up to that hedge and then you're proposing a rain garden back down to 104 I think I can see that grade but I'm not sure what the grade is at street so I don't know how much regrading you're doing from property line to the rain garden it'd, it'd be some there'd be some regrading um, I don't have the exact <laughs> because I'm trying to save this tree right here um, so I don't want to affect the root system. It would be minor, minor rate changes there. That's actually really bad. Which tree? Yeah, I guess our pictures don't show that tree. This mm -hmm. one? Yeah, so, well. the, beat the larger, older tree but in the back? She, no, she's four. Um, no, she's so four. Five and four. Three. Yeah, the, the scale of this of the map and then the street view. Yeah. 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 This is the right of way. It's well well beyond the edge of pavement. I see. I think what's confusing is that the um, 
the property line is well behind the edge of pavement. So the tree appears to be right on the street, but it's, it's not. not. There's, so, right. there's some... The edge of pavement is this yeah. large yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Property line is this heavier, the boulder line here. Mm -hmm. These could extensively put a pretend sidewalk there. But by us removing the, the scrubment, we will improve site distances for, for us and the abutter as well. So the utility pole could still be a problem. I, I can't imagine they're going to move that pole with all that power on it. They won't move them when we want them to. <laughs> If you move a pole yeah. by more than three feet, it requires a, a pole hearing with yeah. the town. And running lights, it's up to them if they feel it's needed or not. They can, they have the power. No pun intended. Right. <laughs> so can we plant some uh, evergreens in that parcel A portion? We could, we certainly could. If we, as we see it, we got there as much as we can as we can, as we can see. But if the board believes it would make sense to put in some, you know, four or five, I guess, uh, on the type of trees and circuits. Looks like there's room for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can work with the abutter on the placement of this <coughs> as well. Really, again, parcel A is meant to be that buffer. So to the extent that they want to have some trees in it and trees in the cities, absolutely. Okay. Um, the EIR, is that actually required or is it more of a notification? So it is listed as one. The subdivision rules and regs are somewhat outdated, as I mentioned in the beginning. They really envision the idea of doing major roadways with many, many lots of lots. And they really haven't been updated at the time with the new design standard, the new design approach of limited purpose area, smaller, smaller design. So it's in there, just like many other things are in there that really probably aren't always followed. Um, because because we we're listing the waivers for a one lot subdivision, we got the traffic import, uh, traffic impact <coughs> study, and the environmental impact report just didn't really seem to make sense for some um, one unit lot subdivision. Especially when it's a low impact design. Other comment? Sorry. The, um the plan assumes that the existing garage uh, will be raised, but it doesn't show any replacement garage for the existing property. Is, is there a, a plan or a pro prohibition? No, they're just, uh, it's not something that, that Mr. Rohrbach has thought about putting in place. It's just the idea of, I guess the garage isn't in great shape. He doesn't use it that much anyways. So he has no issue that it's going to be down. Okay, so there will be basically no garage for the existing property. All right, yeah, yeah, under the, under the proposal. I mean, it wouldn't prevent him in the future from applying to the town to put one in, but, but he doesn't have plans right now. Okay. And, and what he, he couldn't do is build the garage in that right of way. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. right. right. And like at the end of that turnaround, cool. there, it would actually have to go on that, that other parcel. Exactly. Um, other comments? Did you have something else? Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. Just to just to address the uh, environmental impact <coughs> report, um, as uh, Trey Lake said, you know, if, if you look at it and just say, you know, um, traffic isn't an issue, uh, stormwater isn't an issue, so why do you see it? One house. I get that. That, that sounds very practical. However, the environmental impact report is more than that. Um, you know, it's about um, geologic formation. It's it's uh, about archaeological. It's uh, it's about historical uh, significance, as well as wildlife habitat. Habitat, and there's quite a bit of it up in this uh, up in this field up here. So, do you think that it should be done? Thank you. Okay. Sir, did you have a comment? Thirty-nine Grove Street. I live directly across from Mr. Rogash. 
I've been in this town for 40 years and I've seen a lot of good things and I saw a lot of bad things. And uh, I think uh, what Mr. Corbash is proposing there, I think it's a, a good thing. Uh, there's a lot of people that can say it's, it's good and it's bad and whatever, but uh, I think the home is up so far back up there. I think the only Awesome. Uh, probably uh, the only problem I see with it is maybe if somebody is a button at that property, and I don't even who's up there. Um, but uh, as the grocery, I don't think it's going to impact the uh, traffic whatsoever. I know a lot of people will say, you know, the grocery does take a lot of traffic. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it's a lot on the my property or his property, if you get there from 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's like sitting on 128. It's just a lot of traffic. And I don't think another house up there is going to really impact anything. I don't see any, pro uh, any problem with it whatsoever. And uh, as to the, uh, the thing with the, uh, the rain garden, I'm not too sure if I actually understand what the rain garden is. Is that like a separate little piece of land that's going to be maintained? Who's going to maintain it? I don't know. Uh, just, it, it, it's a shallow depression <clears throat> that has plant life in it, and it, it collects storm water as well. So it's a storm water feature plus a landscape feature, but it's just a shallow depression. So there's no make, uh, no maintenance for that whatsoever? There, 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 is, some, point? Th there is some maintenance. So um, we have an operation and maintenance plan, and there's requirements. Um, it's two or three times a year that they have to check. As I talked about, there's a pipe that will come into the rain garden with some stone at the end of the pipe. That has to be inspected to make sure there's not silt or debris that's, that's going into that area. You have to be clean. You have to look at the plant life, make sure that's healthy or it would have to be replanted. Um, there's requirements like you can't dump snow in there. You know, it's not, it's not a snow storage area. So th there's a list of requirements that we spell out in the operation maintenance report that have to be inspected annually. And that's part of the homeowners association. So it has to be maintained. And is that a higher grade than uh, the street or a lower grade? It's a lower grade. Lower grade. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Other comments? Anyone here from Lowell Street or Tanglewood? No butters from there? Yes, sir. Excuse me. I remember the 327 Lowell Street. If I don't I don't have any issues with it. I am a butter, but it, I don't see that it's gonna have any impact on uh, my property. So I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes sir. We have a little butter on Grove Street, it's next to our neighbor on the other side. I do not have a problem with Dave moving ahead with this plan. <coughs> Any other comments from the public? Okay. Comments from additional from the board? Did you ever find anything on that uh, lot shape? I agree, written zoning that's impossible to meet, or potentially, for a cul de sac. Say that again? I mean, if you really want to get into it. No, no, I didn't think it was. I just want to make sure that it's there possible wasn't that we created zoning that's not possible to meet for a lot in a cul de sac. So. Well, that's why we started entertaining these types of developments. I mean, look at the size of that roadway. <laughs> we, I say we, but we didn't write that, yeah. by the way. That we wrote into that. The, the, the original subdivision rules. I'm talking about zoning. You asked about lot shape. Yeah. There's nothing specific about it. We didn't account for cul-de-sacs. Okay. Well, 6212 states the angles formed by the intersection of the side lot lines and the right-of-way providing the minimum frontage shall not be less than 45 degrees. 
Right, so that section actually doesn't apply to this because the title of that section is minimum lot width not specified, and in the S15 zoning district, the lot width is specified. So you actually have to apply the above section to this. Okay. Um, which says more or less the same thing. Yeah. Which is the problem. So if they changed the right of way and just made it straight across, would that solve the problem? I mean, still have frontage if you do that? Yeah, I, I have a hundred. I can't. It's like 146. If I needed to, I could I could make this the required frontage and then create a lot line through here and make this a non-building piece here if I had to. No, why can't that curve just come uh, perpendicular to that side line? Like this? Yeah. I could do it that way too. Does that violate the subdivision rules and regulations at all? No. Didn't do that. Not that I know of. Why? Why did you think that? I'm just asking. Okay. I didn't know something was in your head. About I'm like, <laughs> I think I went like completely white when I read that. I realized. Right. So. It's probably easier to do that than to get a variance. Yeah. yeah. So that's something we should yeah. fix. So I could do it two ways. I could, I could run it perpendicular here, or I could create another piece here and make this a non-building piece, but I, I like the idea of just running it here. Yeah, you only have to get to 45 degrees, right? 45 degrees. Okay. So if there's a gray over here, I can work with that. Okay. Okay. How do we want to deal with that? Do we want to have them submit something to you on that? Yeah, let's condition that. Okay. No other comments. Um, I'll close the public hearing. Move that we close the public hearing for the definitive subdivision um, at Nichols Estates on Grove Street. Second. All in favor? Mr. Chairman, yep. Can we give the uh, the request for waivers to Chris Latham at this point in time? You didn't get a copy, correct? Oh, I, I did. Thank oh, you did. Okay. okay. Sorry. Oh, we did not get a copy. Would you like a copy? Yes. <laughs> thank you. It's not okay. I gave That's not really the request for waivers, though. This is, no, it's uh, not. But we do need it from the abutter. No, I understand, but I don't know that I would call it that. That's what it was titled. I know, I understand. I'm just trying to differentiate it from the request for waivers from the applicant. This is um, it's the opposite. <laughs> Doesn't some attorney in here have real work for this? <laughs> 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 So we have two conditions, right? Right now we have one where the applicant will revise the cul-de-sac or the revise the yeah. lot mm -hmm. to property line. To yeah, so that'll be zone. prior to plan endorsement. Okay. Um. And the second condition is to work with your butter on screening and parcel A. Mm -hmm. That will be prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I, I don't even know how you'd go about doing that. Mm -hmm. What 
What's the question? The question is whether there is really any merit to talking about the utility poll because... No, not the poll. Just that the underground utilities just... You said that we're, you were going to yes. do it, whether you should add an assurance that it I will. believe all of the new utilities in town are required to be undergrounded. That's um, it, but we can make a note. Just because all new utilities, yes, right. Okay. Um, there in the description. This is new town of running standards. And I can say, and shall be underground. All new utilities. Where, which one were you on? Um, on page seven, under during construction, yeah, number so one. Yeah. And just write, I can just add a sentence, all new utilities shall be undergrounded. So the question of that lot line and the street line, is there something that can be left open? I don't think a sidewalk makes any sense, but is it something that, given that, you know, when can you go to the map? I, I think if you can bring the grade down, yeah, the width of a sidewalk, that's probably the best you're going to be able to do there. And then at least it would be in keeping with the rest of the street as right. far as not having a sidewalk, but there'd be a place to stand that was a little <laughs> flat. I just it, it, it can't it say for sure. It could be leveled out if that's a condition that the area between the, the pavement and the lot line and the area of the rain guard be leveled out. Can be leveled out. That's what I think would be the best solution there as opposed to, say, paving a short section. Yeah. And it wouldn't compromise the tree you're trying to save? No. Because the tree's for the back. Yeah. So I'd be okay in this area. But that's not on your property. In the top right away. Right, so that's something you'd have to work out with the town. That's the right. issue there. Right. I'm sorry? Yeah. Have you had the Wilson town approval for level one? Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. So I'll add a condition under on page seven under during construction that they'll work with the town to see about leveling that area. Help with drainage yeah. off the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. There, you know, I still have that update. There's no catch basin immediately out there, is there? No. Yeah. Looks like nothing. Uh, I guess what I would <coughs> I would say suggest that you do there is potentially level it out, but not bring it down to the street. If you bring that down to the street, the yeah, edge of the street's going to erode. Yeah. I think. I mean, if it's if it's level and sort of rising up, but there's a wide level spot behind the, the rise, it'll be okay. It'll definitely fall apart. <laughs> Do we want to talk about these um, flavors one one by one? I mean, the first waiver is uh, regarding showing topography beyond the locus. We've always granted that one. Right. Yeah. And the second waiver is delineating the bounds of any wetlands resource. Can you confirm that there weren't any wetlands within 200 feet? Yeah, Chuck confirmed that. Okay. So conservation Conservation, sorry. Yeah. All right. So there's not even really... So the waiver is not even really waiver. Yeah. Yeah. There aren't any. Not a... You can say you put them on the plan and there's nothing there. It's not... I mean, the waiver is not required because there aren't any. Sure. So you want to scratch that? Yeah. Jack, do you have any comment on that? Or do you want to leave it in just in case? <laughs> um, well, the only the reason for leaving it in is within 200 feet of any portion of the property. So it would, the waiver might. How certain it's are you of that? Not, um, I mean, it's bound, but no. 
Oh, we could, you know, if we could leave the waiver sure. request, just, right. just in case. Okay. All right. Um, waiver three is this traffic study. And the traffic study in and of itself isn't going to show you anything. I guess the, the analysis would be whether you want to look at sight lines. Which you guys are trying to address mm -hmm. with other means. Right. The road doesn't look like it's that blind. I understand what the traffic is like on that street, um, but it doesn't look like a very sharp turn. It looks like I have visibility from. It's not right. I've exited this driveway here. It's the, this corner. Yeah. They come fast, and they can't quite anticipate it. So what would that change? If I mean, changed? I don't know what to do. I'm just saying it, 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 there is definitely a concern right at that zone. Yeah, it's like a but the, the butters but of the driveway can't move. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah no, I agree. There, I mean, there may be a, an existing <coughs> concern, but I don't think there's anything that this proposal right. uh, either mitigates or, or uh, worsens. I, I actually, I think this proposal does that um, would be the, if I were to propose mitigation this is what I would propose is making sure that you have some um, the grading there that doesn't yeah you know grow back up and <coughs> create a sideline issue coming out of that driveway or you know those two driveways it's really all you can do there okay. <coughs> and in fact removing the existing driveway this will improve the mm -hmm. So environmental impact report. Excuse me for just a moment. I, I, I realize the public portion of the hearing is over. Uh, but if I may, I just wanted to show a photo of what the view is from my client's driveway. If that's helpful. Mm -hmm. and I do have an extra copy for Joshua, too. So okay. if, if you think that would be helpful. Um, so the best that this development can do is clear up the space between its driveway and your, your client's driveway so that they have a sight line to the right as they're exiting, correct? Yes. So if we take that grade down a bit and they keep the, the vegetation low as they've claimed that they will, that should help. I agree. Um, now, it's not going to be taken down so low, so low that it would become a parking space for somebody if they ever wanted to do that. I don't think so. Now, there's plenty of parking on site. Okay. According to their plan. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nobody walks that far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I can't promise you that, say, the mail truck wouldn't stop there. I don't know where they typically would stop. Thanks. This environmental impact report, is this an issue? I mean, many of the other subdivisions you've looked at in the last couple of years have also gone to conservation, so they've been reviewed from an environmental standpoint, um, and you technically really haven't had that conversation. Uh, so. I mean, this is a two-lot subdivision. Conservation has looked at it. That's what I'm getting at. It. Just we haven't seen this. Yeah, I've you haven't this really. You have. You haven't required an environmental impact report in the past, but most of the other subdivisions have had an environmental review. So this has had some limited conservation review. Yes. Right. Okay. And actually, the conservation administrator made some comments about maintenance of the rain garden. And this uh, stormwater features. So. Okay. And on this site, that's really that's the only thing that would be reviewed is is um, going looking at that list is um, <coughs> uh, stormwater types of or, or right. water types of issues. Right. And the reduced amount of impervious, given that it's in the aquifer protection district, is a good thing. I mean, they're doing all the right things from an environmental standpoint, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So. No, it's true. I mean, the overlay of the roadway with the driveway is apparent. It's happening there. That's number four. Uh, number five is about lighting the roadway, I would imagine. And there is no roadway to light. 
Right. Do you think you'll have lighting along the driveway, residential type lighting? We got any light poles or anything like that. Section six is your territory. Yeah, uh, it's a design standard that we don't want. <laughs> <laughs> really? And we still have that in our language. We're working on it. Okay. We would if we had uh, if we had larger subdivisions, but we don't yes. see those in this town right. anymore. Right. right. Okay. And then section seven, number seven. Is basically the the requirements to build that roadway as shown in the underlay, the, the right of way part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you waive the the requirements yeah. to construct the full right of way, and instead allow them to construct the driveway. So your comment here is to correct some of this language. Yeah. Did you see that, Jack? Um, My comment number seven waiver number seven. It says the applicant proposes a right of way with the 40 feet and no cul-de-sac termination. But you actually, on the layout, you do have a cul-de-sac. So what we need is to know the diameter of the cul-de-sac so that they can waive the requirement for a 45 foot, sorry, 45 foot radius. So we need to know the radius. We were thinking more of a paved cul-de-sac, but we'll still have a... Like you still have the cul-de-sac layout. So we can provide that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I got do you know what I mean? That. I do know what you mean. Yeah. So the waiver that's really going to be asked for is, is not a waiver in the size of the cul-de-sac it oh, is the cul -de -sac? waiver in the size of the cul-de-sac okay. bowl. Yes. So both a waiver in the size of the cul-de-sac and the the requirement to actually build it. Right, exactly. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, number eight is changes in grade. Again, referencing an ash toast standard for design speed of 30 miles per hour for secondary streets. For me to go 30 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 I dare anyone. <laughs> um, again, 7.1.3 is more about this cross section of the street. Number nine. Number 10 would be the dead end street requiring a cul de sac, I guess, or an island constructed. We're not building the cul de sac, we don't build the island. Number 11 is about curving, but we're going to go low impact. Right. What is the edge of the roadway? What are you going to do there, Jack? Are you doing crushed down or, or just swales? For the shoulder of the, yeah. of the driveway? The shoulder, yeah, of the driveway, right. The crushed up, we then have a crushed down trench between the driveways. Um, it'd be low and seed on, on the other side. Really no shoulder. Okay. Because my drainage system, the both driveways pitch to the middle and go to the, the stone trench. Mm. So is that driveway sloping, the long driveway sloping all the way down to that <coughs> center trench? You know, it's, it's gonna it's, it's it's to the middle. Okay. Yeah. Every, see the one percent grades. Yeah. Everything's sloping over to, to the trench, even through here. And then this driveway is one percent this way, so everything's coming back to this trench area in the middle. But the, the shoulders of the driveway, they'll they'll just be they'll be low and see. Okay. So do we want to vote, vote on these waivers? Individually, do you want to take them all in total? Anyone have any objections to any of them? Any other questions mm -hmm. about them? Just go in total. In total. Yeah. Good Delicious. We have a motion for that, then? Um, move that the CPDC approve the requested waivers. Uh, for the definitive subdivision plan at 40 Grove Street is amended. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. 
check with Josh. Do you have any issues with the with the decision? Okay. All right. So we have those conditions that you've added in a few sections. Mm -hmm. um, screening underground utilities. Working with the town on the gray at that yep. property yep. line in the front. Anything else? Revising the coal sack. Yep, revising the coal sack line. So that was his motion to approve the waivers as amended. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. actually revising the coal sack so it meets spot shape. To submit yeah. something. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Comments? Can I get a motion for this? We move that the CPDC approve the um, definitive subdivision plan for 40 Grove Street, Nicholas Estates. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Close the public hearing. We, we closed close it earlier. <laughs> if anybody's here for the Johnson Woods, they have continued until November 5th. <laughs> Johnson Woods, anyone? Come on up, Chris. Have a good night, Josh. We'll see. Is it friends or stuff everywhere? How's it going? Next up, we have a continued public hearing site plan review for 292, also known as 288 Grove Street, Meadowbrook Golf Club. Administrative staff, 
identified in working through uh, various plan changes, et cetera, comments in there, uh, and so forth. With me tonight is Kevin Roach, who's the president of the board. He's a fair support on the board at Fire Hearings. Andrew Weaver is our architect. And Jack Sullivan is our site civil engineer. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'm going to pass, pass out a simple I'm going to go through in a little bit of detail tonight. I don't want to through this. It has, it has uh, exhibits attached to it, which I will reference as I make my presentation. Last meeting, there were some outstanding issues that were discussed by the CPDC. Um, many of them were engineering uh, in nature. They had to do with uh, curb locations um, and uh, drainage. And uh, Mr. Solomon's worked uh, diligently, as I mentioned, with the time engineer. Um, I think he's been able to address most of those. We'll certainly um, expect that we'll be, might be talking about some of those tonight at the discretion of the um, CPDC. Um, I think that possibly Andrew and our Jew uh, correspond with you on some of those uh, changes and set that have taken place. Um, the, uh, the town engineer's memo back in August went down from a number of items uh, to uh, a memo that was recently submitted uh, to uh, the commission on September 17, 2018, uh, where he references the last revised plan by Mr. Sullivan, and he states the engineering division has reviewed the proposed site application for the proposed project and offers the following comments. First is the modifications to the drainage are acceptable. <coughs> the plan should note the size of the trench drain. And then he goes on and says, the engineering, uh, engineering is satisfied with the cur curvy design of the driveway entrance, but also recommends that when a curb on the south side of the driveway be extended beyond the catch basin. So there was a, a sketch plan that was done and submitted to deal with the um, curbing, which I'm sure we'll be able to talk about as we go on to that was uh, discussed uh, by uh, some of the CPDC members. And, and uh, Jack is uh, ready and willing and able to talk about that. Uh, before we get into to that aspect of it, um, I would like to uh, discuss uh, one of the items that would be requested by the CPDC was a seating occupancy type analysis. Um, and you know, I think the CPDC is aware that we've consistently stated in our correspondence to the uh, administrative division of the town of Reading, the staff, it's well, it's hearing process that it's Meadowbrook's desire to construct a new clubhouse to provide its membership a state of the art uh, building. Um, Meadowbrook has no desire or intent to uh, do anything that would extend. Uh, it's or substantially extend its legal non-conforming use of the building of the property. We have stated that. And I think um, you know the CPDC recognizing that and hearing it said to us, well, you know, give us some more details so we can make a determination and confirm uh, that that is not happening. Um, and we understand that that you know you're you're interested in that, and we actually welcome that process. Um, and we stand behind uh, that commitment and statement that we made to you. And we'll go through that in some detail tonight on some of the information that we're provided. Uh, we believe that we, you know, we're going to provide additional information as requested, and we'll continue to do that um, until you're comfortable. Um, we're, we're here to work with you. We want to get this project done, and we do not want to change or extend anything. So since that last meeting, uh, we provided a memo as it relates to occupancy and seating that was prepared by Mr. Weaver. Uh, it was dated July 30, 2018. Um, it was submitted, and it's also another copy of that is attached to your submittal tonight as Exhibit A. Um, and Andrew goes into um, the occupancy and, and seating uh, on, the, uh, on the site. Uh, since that time, uh, and since the last CPDC meeting, we've been able to obtain correspondence from a, a group of neighbors uh, that was submitted to the Community uh, Development Director. Uh, that was dated September 12th. 
um, and, and question the accuracy of the Weaver study. Uh, I don't know if the, if the commission has had an opportunity to uh, receive that or review it, but specifically, uh, that gave a correspondence alleged that the allowable occupancy load of the existing clubhouse is 184, um, very much in contradiction to um, what had been submitted by Mr. Weaver. So that was obviously of some concern to us. Uh, as I mentioned, through our due diligence, we were able to obtain a copy of that um, from the um, administrative staff. So needless to say, we wanted to look into that right away, and, and that delayed us at the last meeting because we said, well, we better, better get some answers to this before we uh, go back to the CPDC. Um, so we, through due diligence, have learned that this allegation is not correct. Um, specifically, um, we've had the opportunity to meet with the Town of Reading Administrative Staff. We've met with the Building Commissioner, the Fire Chief, and the Community Development Department in this regard. Um, and in that process, we discovered that dating back to 2014, the Certificate of Inspection uh, for Occupancy Load Number uh, from the existing clubhouse was was incorrectly matched to the 184 seating count inside the existing clubhouse uh, as was submitted to the select board and board of health uh, for various permits that are required them for the for the operation um, of the club. This is a contradiction to the requirement that the certificate of inspection and occupancy load for a building should be based on the building code um, calculation, not seating. Um, and what we've done is in Exhibit A, I'm sorry, in Exhibit B in the package, I can refer you to that, please. So I've separated these so there's different pages that you can find Exhibit B. The first page of Exhibit B is actually a certificate of inspection uh, for um, 2017, which coincidentally expires this month. And if you notice, it says allowable occupant load 184 right here. Small print. So what we discovered in our meetings with uh, the town officials that I referenced and in consultation with them, with them, we determined that this certificate of inspection occupancy load for the existing clubhouse was mistakenly or inadvertently changed to 184 due to a new computer software program implemented by the town of Reading beginning in 2014. And that for, for some reason, that software linked op occupancy load to seating. But uh, it's referenced in other departments uh, in the town of Red. Um, so when you look further now in Exhibit D, and on that first page that I just showed you, you notice that the first, the first group of documents are applications for the common victual license. And those applications reference number of seats. 184, doesn't reference pocket and pocket low. Um, as you go on, you will see, for example, in the 2014 actual common victual license that was issued that's seating 184 customers. So that certainly uh, also uh, doesn't reference low, and certainly is not limited, it limits it to potentially the outside folks and not members. These, if you go through this, you will see through those years, 14 through 18 uh, is very consistent for the common victual. And once you get through the common victual in Exhibit B, you'll find the applications for the permits required for the Board of Health for the operation of Metalworks. And on page two of those documents uh, related to Board of Health, you'll notice right in the middle, it says that it's an annual license 100 plus seats, and then it says number 184 seats. <coughs> now 
interestingly, what we did is we said, let's take a look, tie into this computer change that happened. And you'll, you'll see uh, in your packet exhibit C. In exhibit C, we've included the certificates of inspection for 2012 and 2013. <coughs> and the occupancy load that's referenced, um, or occupants that reference is allowed in the existing clubhouse um, is well over 300. When you add these up, the different places that uh, folks uh, would assemble or eat, etc. Now this is this is confirmed by um, an email that was um, sent to Julie, um, who you know through our meetings with her was, was happy to share this with us. We appreciate that because we're all just trying to get to the bottom of what what transpired here. And, and this was an email that was sent from Kim Saunders, who is the permits coordinator in the public public services department of the town of Reading, um, who was very helpful in trying to investigate you know what what transpired here. Um, in, in part, uh, in the email um, to Julie, she states, as I discussed with you, the 184, and I'm quoting from the email, occupancy that is now on the certificate of inspection are the number of seats, not capacity. The number changed when the system was switched over to view permit in 2014. The building inspector who does the inspections does not review the certificate before it's issued. This era, and then it says he, go, he goes to the property of the fire department to verify the business is safe, to operate emergency and exit flight egress, et cetera. And then I stress this. This era was not noticed by Melbourne. My client did notice it. Like, well, many people want to do the thing. They apply, they get it, and they put it in the drawer, they work for it, they go post it, whatever it is, but they don't look at it in detail. Um, it says, and it goes on, it will be fixed before the, the certificate is issued for this year. It's interesting that this Saunders references that the certificate of inspections from 96 until 2013 had the following capacities, which actually match with what I provided to you. And, and that says, in the email, it says total 319 table slash chairs, 639 chairs only. So I think that email um, is uh, somewhat <coughs> telling. Now, it's interesting because when we had a meeting with um, the administrative staff, who again were very helpful, it was suggested by um, the town of Reading's building inspector and the fire chief. And we talked about what we had done with the, um, with the study that we had submitted to you. And, and the study that Andrew had initially completed, he was really um, focusing more on where the events would occur. Know, where eating would occur, occur and dining would occur, which is in, in the new um, facility is mostly upstairs um, because not a lot is going downstairs. There's certainly nothing in the, in the new facility. Downstairs currently is just a cop room for the members. And, and both both of those uh, town offices suggested, suggested to us we discussed it, what was going on, that perhaps it would be more appropriate to do a analysis of the entire building. Um, from an occupancy load perspective um, to compare both buildings, not just the top level, not just certain aspects of it, but the building as a whole. So we took that to heart, and uh, Andrew um, prepared that, um, which is attached to his Exhibit D, you submittal. And this is where it really fits home on the um, what's being proposed here to the existing structure. Um, what, what you'll see is the occupancy load on the existing clubhouse is 427 people, and on the new clubhouse it's 292 people, with a significant uh, decrease. Um, also, in the areas where people will be congregating, so for example, the grill room, dining room, golf dining, 19 pole, when you compare them apples and apples going across, and this includes the cod room, um, for the existing clubhouse will be 336 occupancy load, the uh, proposed clubhouse or the new clubhouse will be 225. 
and those numbers are derived from, from the existing clubhouse taking the car eating room, the grill room, the dining room, and the 19th hall, total up to 336. On the proposed, we're taking the grill room, the dining room, the golf dining, which is in essence the card room, uh, and the 19th hall for a total of 225. Um, you may notice on this that um, Andrew did not include any decks uh, because decks are not included in an occupancy load um, for a building. We're certainly not saying that they don't have relevance in your decision and how you look at things, but for a raw determination of the occupancy load of a building, um, they are not included. But that's the way Andrew did that. So now we get to the number of seats because um, the number of seats in the occupancy load, I think, are you know, as you know, we're really a different animal, and that was something that you were were very interested in. Um, the neighbor uh, correspondence, you know, interestingly references um, uh, in in it that the intensity of use is predicated in large part on seating capacity. So, you know, that's what um, the neighbors who are opposing us are, are stating, that you know, you've got to look at the seating capacity because that really uh, goes hand in hand with the uh, intensity of the use. You know, as we stated, Meadowbrook has no desire to extend, um, to substantially extend the non-conforming use. So in that regard, you know, we have occupancy permits that give us or give my client numbers of 319 tables, 639 chairs. You know, we're not here to argue for that. You know, all they want, and, and what they've stated from the beginning, is I think what everybody needs is reasonable use of the property and, and would be allowed in comparison with their current use. So in that regard, um, what we would request is that we would be limited to 200 seats. Um, every report references 184, some going back to 95, reference a lot more, but the lowest number that you see is 184. We think 200 is a reasonable number, and even if you start at the baseline of 184, by adding 16 seats is certainly not a, a, a substantial extension. Um, however, if the CBDC says, well, you know, you stated in your filings, et cetera, you had 184 seats. We are going to look at that. And we would entertain that as a condition. Um, and we would ex uh, expect that it's something that you may want to confirm that there will be no extension of uh, this non-conforming use. So, you know, that is something that you know, we're willing to entertain uh, as a, a possible condition in your site plan approval process. In addition to the inside seating that we've discussed, um, Meadowbrook has a seasonal outdoor accessory deck that has 36 seats, and the new clubhouse proposes a seasonal accessory terrace deck with 36 seats plus two couches and two spot chairs that suppose would be two extra, you know, 10 extra seats. We're just looking at this puppet seating. There's certainly not where someone's gonna sit down at the table and eat, but people might wanna move around, get comfortable, chat. So that's what we propose on that. Um, and we also uh, reference that this would not be used for any pr private functions after 9 p.m. Uh, the, in essence, the deck would be shut down at nine o'clock in an effort to limit the use of the site. Um, and that was, that's been a, a long-standing uh, proposed condition. Um, we're also, uh, our plan also calls for an outdoor porch that would have 20 seats. And the main purpose of that is to accommodate um, people who use the pool in the summertime, that they would have a place to maybe grab lunch and not have to change and get dressed and go into the uh, dining room that they could be outside. Um, you know, as we stated, that's only for the pool. Most people are going to be eating somewhere on the property, so it's not like it's designed to intensify the use or extend it. It's just to accommodate current people that are already uh, on the site in, in a good faith effort uh, to 
confirm that or are willing to entertain a, a condition that that would be shut down for any uh, use except the egress uh, and access to the clubhouse after 3 p.m. So there's no intent to use that for functions or anything like that that might occur at night uh, is in, is, uh, in the winter. So once again, um, as I mentioned, we, you know, we welcome the process. We're happy to entertain a condition um, that would limit the seating in those two areas um, and also would limit the time of the use and the intensity of the use uh, in uh, certain hours. Um, I guess uh, the other concern um, that we heard uh, that's been raised is that you know with this new beautiful facility um, you're going to attract all types of sorts of functions that you didn't attract before and that's going to cause you know an extension of the non conforming use it's going to intensify it um, i will be i would respectfully suggest that you know any allegation in, in that regard is really certain respect i mean nobody knows that that would happen you know, you know who knows whether that would happen or not uh, but once again, recognizing the concern in, in an effort to be cooperative, um, that work is willing to entertain some uh, conditions in that regard. Um, so, Meadowbrook has done some research uh, with a number of private events and functions that it has hosted uh, at the club since 2013. Uh, we provide a detail on that in Exhibit E. Um, We'll find cell spreadsheets for each year. We'll be detailed the exact event that's happened over the past five years at the club, the exact private event or function. Um, it's interesting to note, um, as we stated when we initially presented, that you know this facility in many ways is part of the Red community because Meadowbrook is very um, giving. Uh, of their facility to um, ready um, um, clubs, uh, high school um, teams uh, for banquets, uh, the golf team we mentioned uses the club. So you know, they're really, uh, for, it, it, for, in many respects, a part of the community, uh, the way they operate and open their facility uh, to the ready community uh, to help them. And so what we've done in this Excel spreadsheet, we've actually made, put in bold uh, the various um, Items that could be considered to be town type items that are actually hosted as a part of the uh, events that take place. So, for example, Reading Golf High School Golf Banquet, Reading Police, uh, Reading High School Boys Tennis Banquet, Police Department Party, Reading Garden Club, Lions Club, Friends of Reading Hockey, uh, Boys Tennis, uh, Jimmy Friend Events. So. Uh, Chamber, Chamber of Commerce in the town of Reading that um, to host the tournament and also to utilize um, the, the facility. What, what Meadowbrook also realized is they looked at the numbers of the folks that you know normally um, would attend these events. And what they found is, and, and Kevin testified to this, that most of them, you know, are actually small in nature. They, usually, they have to be sponsored by somebody at the club that's a member of uh, part of the club. And um, usually they're somewhere around 50 or less, or sometimes they go up to 90. But uh, they did discover that they actually never exceed 140, and that would be, you know, not happen very often. But the highest number that would be would be. Uh, a private event or a function that would be uh, 140 people. So I just want to point this out because in the a fire, um, I guess opposition that you received the neighbor memorandum that was submitted on September 12th, um, they referenced that uh, they said not only is Meadowbrook limited to 186 in occupancy, um, as I've already stated. Um, they said that they're only allowed to have 140 seats, or they only have 140 seats, as is evidenced by their own website. Um, so I'd like to submit, if I may, a copy of the website.
But when it was stated um, in the neighborhood memo, September 12th, um, I'll quote, as a result, the current level of use slash intensity of use is predicated in large part on total seating capacity, which, you know, again, we're going to uh, condition, of approximately 140, and it states, per applicant's website. Well, if you read the website on, on the cover of the website, and I'll read it, it says, quote, our clubhouse provides dining services to the membership and is able to accommodate, accommodate functions of up to 140 guests. So it doesn't say that they have, they have 140 seats. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, that coincides with what the maximum that they found, and it works very well, uh, potentially, with, with the conditions that we are opening ourselves uh, up to. I guess, you know, once again, I just want to be clear that we have consistently stated that the sole purpose of the construction of the clubhouse is to provide a state of the art building. Um, there's going to be a continuation of the tenants there many times of the current use, the way it works now. Um, in the existing clubhouse, uh, that will, is going to occur in the new clubhouse. There'll be no change, there'll be no substantial extension of the use. Meadowbrook is going to put put that statement um, right on the table and will open itself, itself up to conditions, um, as I mentioned. Um, and you know, some of these, some conditions have already been delineated uh, in the draft decision that's been uh, prepared and circulated by the administrative staff. Um, some additional possible conditions were discussed and presented by me tonight. And we're happy to entertain more. Uh, if you are, uh, permission may be necessary to um, assure yourselves that as time goes on, there will not be an opportunity um, for a substantial extension of the non-conforming use. And I want to uh, stress the word substantial because that's what the statute calls for. That it could be an extension, there could be some changes, but you can't do a substantial extension. So any of these things that are changing a little bit potentially, like the outdoor porch, that's limited to time, you don't have to exactly match. As long as it's reasonable in your determination that no substantial extension of the non conforming use is taking place. Um, the, the other thing I'd like to, I guess in closing on what, I, what I'm going to present in this regard is, um, we welcome, you know, I, I don't want to come across a long way with the, with the neighborhood opposition, we welcome it. Um, I, I think that with all due respect to them, they raised a good issue on the on the occupancy. Um, and you know, I think it kind of caught everybody, the administrative staff and us, like, wow, you know, where, where did this come from? Um, and so it was it was a legitimate issue and, and we commend them, you know, for finding that. But you know, as we presented tonight, there are answers to that. Um, and certainly there are uh, conditions that we presented that can deal with uh, any issues to make sure. There's no extension. So that, that deals with, with that aspect of it. I guess we're, we're happy to um, deal with any of the other issues you want to deal with or certainly entertain um, any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Uh, comments from board or staff? <clears throat> well, it sounds like we need to get the certificate of in inspection corrected. Uh, or it's something that, that would be perhaps a good idea. Yes, it will be corrected this month when the 2018 certificate is issued. It was good. It's October 17th. Okay, that's good to know. I guess um, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, uh, I when uh, right we you've been here twice so far right once some time ago and um, I through the these two those last two discussions uh, um, I was very concerned that what you were um, what you were um, planning on constructing would open up to sort of a more um, intense use of the facility and, and therefore more impacts 
um, and, and and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I sort of I dug around a little bit myself, and um, you know, sort of uh, right where you're coming down to. Of I guess, and, uh, uh, let me back up. And to me, um, the possibility of having more and or larger events is really the thing that that I saw as a as a red flag um, that may that may not that may be an issue not more um, not necessarily more members or anything but just the opportunity that you might be having to have um, more and bigger events and um, and um, you know and I, I did see that you know in the past you like your like your website says here and I found it or actually a earlier version of it that used a 150 150 um, uh, number as a as an event maximum um, and and to me um, you know your proposal of limiting it to 200 seats is um, or, or 200 seat occupancy really to me um, uh, minimizes that concern that I had previously because I, I do you know with all of this information I, I think that that you've displayed that you are you know it's within the same envelope um, the future use and the, and the past use so um, um, to me in, in, in my mind someone may come and put something else on the table that changes my mind but um, but I think that, um, I, I feel like you have enough information to um, hear I'm just trying to reconcile the numbers between the July 30th memo and the October 1st memo Tell me what the differences are between the seating. It's an outdoor. This does not include the 99 people. Is that what that is? That. Yeah, from the the original uh, calculations to the new one, we eliminated the outdoor seating because those are not considered part of uh, occupancy load. I mean, I'm, I'm not really looking at. I mean, grill room goes. One says 72, one says 73. Event dining room, sorry, uh, one says 60, one says 73. So you're building the outdoor seating into the indoor rooms? Which one says 60? So if you look at Exhibit A, yeah. there's a memorandum dated July 30th, the second page of that, which has the proposed new clubhouse seating counts. Seating? You want seating? Yes, sorry. Yeah, that, 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 that memo, the seating in that earlier memo is basically, with all due respect, I don't think relevant at this point because we're not, we're, 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 we're agreeing that we will limit the seating. Um, that memo, that memo calculation would go more hand in hand with the fire certificates of occupancy that issued 2013, 2012, and before that had, um, a lot of seating capacity, um, but once we saw that 184 that was presented, um, and we discussed what happens at the club now, my client said we can live with that. You know, we think 200 is fair, but you know we're never going to have that number of people in this. It's not going to happen. So to get everybody comfortable with this, um, and to make sure that your, your commission and the administrative staff can, can feel comfortable that there's no extension, we're, we're happy to, to kind of throw that page out and then and just condition the seat. So that's why this memo that was issued a later, mem later memo dated today mm -hmm. does not include the <coughs> seating. It's just it's occupancy. It's occupancy. So if you compare the occupancy loads from the previous. Okay. The, the first the, page of the memo is yeah. the same. To the same. new, they are the same. Yeah, same. Yeah, see Seating is different, as you know. Under the code, you calculate based on net or gross square footage for the use in that space. Uh, and seating is a function of what you can actually physically put in the space. So the, the 184, as I mentioned, does not include the outdoor seating. That's an addition, but that's only seasonal. Um, it, it basically, the Taurus uh, deck virtually matches what's happening on the current deck. And so really the only addition is the forge, which is very limited in time. 
which is really going to take people that can pull from one area and just put it in a different area. It's not going to go into a scan and bring it up. So can I bottom line this and you tell me if I'm right or wrong? I just I feel like I've had a deluge of information um, wash over me here. So bottom line, you've been existing under an, an assumed occupancy load of 184. And that's what you've, you know, based on error or whatever it is, you've been working off of that for a while. Seating, sorry, seating, seating capacity. Well, the certificate of inspection said 184 too, if I'm mistaken. So you're, you're probably correct with that statement. Right? So that's what I'm trying to yeah. understand. So at this point in time, if you had 200 people inside the club at one time, you'd be violating the occupancy by the fire department. Yeah, and correct? From what, we, from what we've learned, probably every entity in the town of Brightingwood right now, because this, this error did not happen to just us. That's correct. Yes, but what you're saying is correct. That 184 number has been which is been not operating actually under, under at the moment. Though. And so what you're yeah. proposing yeah. is that to alleviate the concerns that have been challenged by all these different numbers and square footages and calculations, you're going to stick with 200 as the for the new place as the occupancy load. That's what I'm not under. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Seating. So, so I want, yes, 200 inside seating. And the occupancy load is what's in Andrew's letter. Right. And the occupancy load is what is required by fire and building, et cetera, to go through the permitting process. And we, we use that as the, as the calculation to help us determine the load in the building. Seating is something we are conditioning in to maximize our internal seating at 200 to, to eliminate any configuration, questions, concerns, et cetera, because that can all change however you want to configure it. We're saying no more than 200. Okay. That, Ryan, I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> occupancy, yeah. occupancy lets you decide, um, I'll simplify this, yeah. how big the doors are, yeah. how many people you can get out. How many bathroom fixtures you need? To well, yeah, I mean, so so at a maximum attendance, attendance situation, you know, July 4th, you cannot have physically more than 200 people inside that building at the same time. No. 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 So that's what I'm trying to understand. No. 324. 324. 324. Correct. Okay. But what we're saying is we will condition in our seating, which, yeah. has, which is a lower number than occupancy low, we will condition in no more than 200 seats in the, in the new facility in such a building. Okay. Yeah, the other thing would, that we put out as a condition is that the private fence functions would be one of the So, yeah. Okay. So that's okay. that's a driving force too to limit. The, okay. So you're not going to you're not going to have a, a 200 seat function. That we know yeah. Because right now we said we are 140. And as it's on our website, we're willing to live by that. That's that's what everyone anticipates. All right, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Under the current setup, my understanding you have two levels, correct? So today's seating of, let's call it 184, whatever it is, is divided between the upper level and the lower level, correct? There is, there's a card room on the lower level. Okay. And that is how, roughly how many? 42 people. 42. So upstairs, if there's 200 total or whatever, there's 200 minus 42. Well, upstairs, well, upstairs is more than that right now. Um, right now, upstairs in the existing clubhouse. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Yeah, I know you're talking to me. Oh, keep going. I, yeah. I apologize. So it's it's upstairs. I believe it's 200. Where's well, <laughs> <laughs> it's approximately 400. Okay. So 201. Yeah. 201. All right. That's what I was. So technically, right now, you've got. 243 or whatever in the entire clubhouse. Correct. For seating. For seating. Right. And it'll be down to 200 for the entire clubhouse. Right. Right. But it'll all be on one level. Correct. Right. 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 Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, and I have a hunch, that's an interesting point, because I have a hunch that the 184, I think that is derived from 
valve alone. Mm -hmm. I think they derive that by looking at it and saying, if you have people in here with a function or something, that's the 184. I can't prove it at this point, but I don't think that, I think the 42 with the seats uh, downstairs were just different because that's where the members just hung out with playing cards, et cetera. And, and I wanted to, because you bring up a good point, we are moving all of the main areas of seating, entertainment, et cetera, all into the main, the top floor, there'll be nothing else. Okay. Yeah. My concern was that you were going to take advantage of the fact that you had two levels merging together and that would be one bigger level. No, but no, no. Our, des our design shows exactly that how we play that out. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the board? Comments from the public? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, Director uh, Stephen Chicatelli representing uh, Nicholas uh, Bonanno and Paul Krasia, the um, uh, director of ours across the street to the property. I just say my, my apologies for that. I didn't know that you were going to see those two early memos that were given to the, uh, to the commission. Uh, one of the issues that I, that I know um, the, the commission had a question, a couple of board members had a question, was whether this was. Um, this is simply a, a change to the building, an improvement to the building, a training program that used the term of creating a state-of-the-art building, or whether uh, it was a substantial alteration or expansion to the existing non-conforming use. Uh, the cases that have been uh, quoted by, by the applicant are Compton Farms and, and, and Powers. Uh, and and the, the issue really is whether there's a change in the quality or character of the, um, of the use. And the concern that we have had, and this is we're seeking really, I think, has to be looked at as well as the overall design of the building. Uh, it, it's, it's that. The building size is, is, is not changing. We're well aware the location apparently is not changing. So the, the concern is whether there's a, a change of use, such as there's a change in the character or the quality of the use, and, and we feel that there, there might be. I, I think when we talk about this 184, figure we're really talking about semantics regardless of how the occupancy load was established the call the common victual license all the all alcohol and beverage license issued by this town for many many years have been based on a seating of 184 for the entire building uh, and if it's common victual or uh, and, and, and all alcohol and beverage i assume that's inside and out so that's the pre-existing use that's the pre-existing use um, whether it's by mistake or not, that's what we're dealing with. So we're going from 184 to a much higher figure if we look at the outdoor seating. And, and more importantly, I think we're looking at a change in the use. We no longer have a facility that has uh, function facilities, restaurant facilities that service the membership, but we have a facility that basically has expanded, has more unique spaces that can be combined to basically service functions. Uh, as we've indicated, and I would also note in the Cumberland Farm space, just as a uh, sort of a qualification, uh, that was a, a property located in the commercial zone. Uh, there was evidence submitted in that case that there would not be an intensity to use. I, I do concur with the training material that the size of the structure is not necessarily material. But again, relative to quality and character, I do feel uh, that, that there is a, uh, a change in the quality and character. Um, the, the issue of, of, of traffic, um, I know my client has submitted photographs to you uh, of uh, delivery trucks. You know, one of the main concerns that we have is this commission in many cases will require a traffic study for a commercial project in a commercial zone. We have a fairly substantial uh, commercial development in a residential zone. We strongly feel that a traffic study uh, would be uh, advisable in this situation because, again, based on the current location of the building, we're questioning whether that traffic study could perhaps uh, give us some information as to whether the character or the quality of the use is going to be changed. Uh, we, it, would, it would certainly give us uh, some information perhaps on level of service at that intersection or other intersections. It would give us some information rel relative to, to queuing. Some of the photographs 
that my client has submitted shows uh, quite a few 18 wheelers that do make deliveries. And unfortunately, the only way really to safely make a delivery is to park an idle on Grove Street because they can't uh, pull into uh, a parking lot that is full at capacity. Uh, clearly, some of the larger trucks cannot make the turnaround on the proposed uh, entranceway. Uh, so we're very much concerned on that. Um, one of the other uh, items that's been sort of presented is the possibility of conditions being put in place. But I think we're taking things out of order. The board has to first find whether this uh, will meet the, the Cumberland Farms test or the Powers test. Uh, I don't think you can say, well, we're not going to say an expansion has occurred uh, you know, because we have put in conditions in place. You have to first decide if this is a, a, an expansion, then you put the conditions in place. And then we have to look at the conditions. How are these conditions enforced? I don't know, uh, even with the good intentions of the commission, I don't know how one would enforce the number of functions. My client can't be there with a pen and paper and determine how many functions in terms of how many people attend the function. It's really impossible to uh, in enforce that, uh, including the building inspector and the, uh, the board of selectmen is, is not going to get want to get involved in that. One of the other questions is what exactly is being permitted? Uh, I raised the question at the last uh, meeting, and I don't think it, the, the answer was really, um, uh, the question was addressed. Um, the applicant did announce to the neighborhood that pieces of land were going to be sold for house lots that was going to help fund the project. As I've said, I, I think we have to assume there's going to be an increase in functional activity simply to carry the debt service on a $3.5 million project. But the applicant did mention to a butters that lots would be sold via 81 complaints filed with this, um, with this commission. Um, so the question is, what are you permitting? If you permit a site that contains 10 acres and then five acres are sold, what is the validity of that permit? What is the effect on the new homeowners that have yet to purchase these lots? So I, I really don't know what the actual site is. You have a plan that shows an entire piece of land, but by the applicant's own admission, it's not going to include all that land in the near future because much of it, or a portion of it, I should say, is going to have to be sold in order to fund the, um, the project. So, so again, at the end of the day, you received the, um, the information from the abutters, the concerns of my clients. We appreciate the condition, but the one condition that is of a paramount importance to my client is the relocation of the building, which potentially could provide for additional parking, which we feel will be necessary, uh, and more importantly, provide a longer driveway, better queuing the traffic, uh, and, and uh, more pedestrian and vehicle safety in terms of um, uh, deliveries. Thank you. Comments on that? <coughs> more comments from the public? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike DeBarco, 422 Grove Street. Just a question on parking. I know there's a fair bit of on street parking. In the new facility, uh, are there additional off street spaces or are there fewer off street spaces? Um, there's definitely some parking down the street. I think we asked the uh, police department. Well, we asked, could we ask about whether they're allowed to park on the street? Um, engineering and police. So there's no, currently no regulations, but engineering did want to have vertical granite curving along that stretch of Grove Street. Um, and they're not, they're definitely not a fan of the pole, the head first pole in parking. Um, and if parking is added to Grove Street, it will need to be formalized. Um, Do we have the revision i guess to that front we should probably have jack present the revised yeah. plans so i guess if i can interrupt um so i thought that we were just going to deal with the use issue because right then there's this whole set of issues related to the site plan and and parking and those sorts of things that are sort of i'm going to say <laughs> Uh, probably most effectively dealt with separately than 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 use. the question of whether it's uh, extension or you know the, um, the you know the, the use issue. Okay, so we can get to that. We can get to the parking piece. Uh -huh. So the 19 Grove Street. There's when people bring up parking on Grove Street. 
There are no regulations on Grove Street, and there's really no safe place to ever park on Grove Street. So, with due respect, if parking is an issue, then the town needs to come up with some bylaws, and that should not be a factor in this decision process, in my opinion. Okay. I agree. <laughs> the Board of Selectmen are the uh, road commissioners. Maybe. Engineering division is not in favor of parking <coughs> along Grove Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. They would like it curbed. Understood. Right. But currently there aren't any signs that says no parking here. Right. Correct. On either side. Right. right. But to John's to John's point, why don't we right? finish right. on the No signs. Um, right now there are signs. That say no parking? Yes. Um, Anywhere in close proximity right to now, the Right now, why don't we move on with this yes. first piece here about character, quality, use, uh, expansion. Yes, sir. If I may just address Attorney uh, Jack Shelley a few of those comments. Just to okay. With those other additions. Um, I think what's happening here is some of the uh, findings they made the determination that they just don't like where the, where the clubhouse is going to be located. Um, and what we've actually done, and the reason is, uh, besides site plan approval, but this in essence is a high right uh, type project, is currently that the clubhouse as it exists does not meet the front setback on the bylaw. We're actually pulling it away from the street. And in doing so, it, the new building, which has, you know, in essence, has nothing to do with the use of structure itself, will meet uh, all of the uh, current uh, dimensional requirements and actually improve the situation, um, get rid of a uh, dimensional deficiency that exists with the uh, existing clubhouse building of the front setback. Um, you know, it was stated that there might be a change or something exchange that's uh, substantial. Again, you know, it's all, that's, that's all hypothetical. And I think with all due respect, and that's trying to position oneself <coughs> to try to get buildings located where we don't want to put it in, and quite frankly, we don't have to put it in. Um, and um, you know, the outdoor seating is, is, is vested, that's been there, I think that's well known. Um, but with continuously uh, expanding that, we've already explained that. Um, traffic study. Um, traffic study, with all due respect, is not warranted here. We're not changing the use. We're not extending the use here. Once you make that determination, nothing's happening. If this was a new project, we were saying we're coming in and we want to put a, a, a club that doesn't exist or something new, then, then you need a traffic study. But everything we present and all the conditions that we're willing to entertain are going to assure that there's not going to be any change uh, to the, 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 the use that's occurring on the uh, site today. Um, you certainly can condition your site plan approval, and they are enforceable. Um, and you can do so to make sure that one um, does not uh, extend the non-conforming use. Um, you have the power to do that, and they are enforceable. And the example of the number of functions, you could put a condition that we have to file a report with this uh, with the planning department every year, a detailed list of those functions and evidence that's satisfactory to them that that's what's occurred. Perhaps it would have to be submitted under the pains and penalties of perjury. Um, but they're relying on it. We're not, we're not shying away from that. We're not playing a game here. My clients don't want to expand this beyond what they already said. So we're happy to abide by any conditions and any enforcement mechanism that you might deem appropriate. But that certainly can be implemented uh, and enforced. Um, as far as other pieces of land, whatever's going to happen in the future with all due respect is not the subject of the parents um, And if Meadowbrook decides in the future, um, which they certainly have not at this point, to do something else with their land or something else with their club, then they're going to have to abide by all the rules and regulations of the town of Reading like anybody else. And as you can see from them being here tonight, they were more than willing to go through that process. Uh, but. Um, we, there's no plan in place to do anything at this point uh, with any other property. So it certainly would not be appropriate uh, to consider something possible that might happen in the future. Again, that event would stand on its own, on its own and uh, be totally separate and independent um, from what's happening. Sorry. So that's our position on those items. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Did you have more to state on that? I, um, I, I didn't. I, um, I, I, um, I, I guess I'm in agreement with the information that's presented to us and uh, um, um, that um, I'm comfortable that it isn't. I'm, um, I, so 
sorry, what's the term? <laughs> it is, it is expansion. Yeah, yeah, expansion of the non-conforming use. use. Um, in, in, in which I think was, as we had mentioned in previous, that was, um, right, we need to get over that first and then move on to the, the site plan. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm um, satisfied that it, it is not, but I don't know if, if everyone else is in that same place. Should we move to make a determination? Uh, if there's no more discussion on it. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, Nick Bernardo, 283 Grove Street, and I just have a few bits of information regarding the parking. There are no parking signs, um, but only on the east side of Grove Street after 293. And there are still cars that are parked there, and stuff like that. so there, are, there is some, but obviously not enough. Okay. Um, regarding the, the setback issue, uh, it's not conforming. It's not conforming because that's what the note was requested when they expanded the building back in 1970 something, I believe. So that was a, an approved encroachment on the setback. Um, regarding the, I'm not sure if I'm using the right words, but in terms of, let me backtrack. On the 184, I'm glad that finally came to light. Um, the document that was presented to you, the separate fault document, was predicated on on the uh, definition that came from the building department, both uh, Kim and Glenn, stated 184 is the total number of people in the building at any one time, including employees, people in the locker room, people sitting down eating, people at the bar, what have you. They just said, that's it, 184. So that's why the statement in that letter reads that way. Um, I appreciate the fact that it, it's only come to light of what's going on with these numbers. Um, regarding the, uh, real, the real concern about this proposed building, nobody's objecting to the club constructing a new building, but the real concern is that this building, as proposed, has all kinds of additional capabilities in terms of being able to host more functions and events than the existing building. And I, I, I can take the applicant at their word that they don't have any intention of expanding, but as, as Attorney McGraw even stated, it, nobody knows what the future is going to be. So this building, as proposed, effectively kind of opens Pandora's box. And whether it's five years, ten years, fifteen years, you know, we go through a recession, they lose 15, 20 percent of the members, they start cranking up the functions and events to replace the revenue. Um, that's no, I'm going to have to say though that that then would be a change in character and quality. I think that would be an expansion of the non-conforming. They'd have to come before the town for that, and they probably wouldn't get approval for that. Well, well that's the concern. But, that but someone could say that um, they could build a structure to support a 10-story building, right? He could design a structure that supports a 10-story building. He's got two stories on it now, and well, in the future, he might add eight stories. That's not likely to happen. Right. Because that's, that's, so visible that's, a, that's an important point, though. Um, they could sell six of the holes and have a what is it? A three hole golf course <laughs> and have a putting green. That would be a significant change to how they're using that, and they'd have to come before it, and they probably wouldn't get approval for that. So if they want to, to sell it to start subdividing houses, and the golf course goes away, it's no longer a clubhouse for a golf course. No, I'm just saying the clubhouse has proposed has the ability. The uh, uh, is not ex to. Excuse me, there's, there's no evidence that <coughs> the new building will have more capacity or more, more availability. Sure. We, we've determined ex ex over and over again that the new proposal is the same size or smaller than the existing one. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't understand what you're basing your assumption on. Because all the walls are movable. They can configure the space uh, to create rooms of different sizes to handle you know, or to attract different events or functions that they can't currently attract today. I'm just saying that the ability will be there to do it, which is something the ability that they don't have today. With with the with the, the same uh, capacity limitations or lower than what is currently there. 
And with the site plan decision and the conditions in the site plan decision, this will run with the land and it will be enforceable. Town staff will be able to enforce it. Right. And we will. And if we do require a condition that they provide a list of functions every year, we will be able to determine if they're if they're using the site more intensely than they have in the past and if they need to come in for a special permit. And that is a whole process unto itself. Okay. And well, you'll be if you still live in the neighborhood, you'll be notified of that process. Right. I'm just those are the concerns that you know, okay. potentially it opens the door to do something that can't do today. And with the outdoor spaces, uh, you know, there's just a lot more square footage that they're gonna have outside and they're moving. The existing deck seats twenty eight people, I don't know where thirty six came from. And a third of the square footage on the existing deck is used for an exit ramp off the kitchen. So the amount of usable square feet that the existing deck is smaller than what, what was permitted uh, in total. Um, the two decks together, total square footage is around 2,100 square feet. Uh, granted, some of it isn't usable because of the swinging doors out of the lounge into the front of the terrace. But how do you police the seating on the terrace? You know, they could have. And they had other plans in the past that showed 68 seats on that terrace. Um, if they're having post-tournament barbecues, they're going to have, they could have 60 people. Is there a way to condition the number of people and how do you police it? <clears throat> well, I'm sure that if there is something uh, outrageous, then the neighbors will take care of the policing. The with the fire department. Yeah. I mean, 66 standing, so if they can recognize it for hours. I mean, I'm in agreement with John. I just don't think that this is a substantial change from what's going on there now. I think the building is much better. I think the arrangement is much better. It, sure, it would be great if it was three miles back, but this is where it is. It's set back more. It's going to have a better look and a better presence, a better scale. Um, my concern with the loading area, due to the placement and the arrangement, that was my biggest piece, and we can talk about that, but this, this green space that you see here with this additional curbing, which prohibits parking along that whole edge, mm -hmm. I think gives the ability for someone to actually pull up in, you know, almost adjacent to the green space if there is a truck loading there. And so they wouldn't be queuing on the street necessarily. There's there's like some time to to make one vehicle go past another. Yeah, yeah. my two concerns are like you said, Nick, from a site plan perspective, is the loading and the the parking, parking. Um, along mm -hmm. along Grove Street. Um, the the loading, not loading along Grove Street, loading as they proposed it, um, <coughs> and then the parking um, in the in the front. Um, yeah, and I do think this solves part of it. I'm still concerned about the um, about the loading. Um, and we know from experience that <coughs> the truckers will not necessarily do things the way we would like them to do. But it's at least as good, if not substantially better, than what's there now. I was going to ask a question about the porch. I think this has come up a few different times in terms of, you know, conditions. Is this something, you know, can you remind me again why we took it off of the list here um, and why not bring it into some of these counts so that there's more assurances here that that doesn't become, you know, the party deck type of thing? Well, in terms of occupancy, the decks are not included under the building code and they're not regulated by the fire department and the building departments. So they are they're separate entities. Uh, the deck, if you build a deck, there's no uh, maximum or minimum capacity under the code uh, on which you can use that deck other than structural issues, maybe if it's an over the deck. But I think in terms of seating, it comes down to uh, the layout of tables and chairs and what can fit and can't fit and how you service that space more than anything else. And that's why on the seating, the original seating counts, you saw what, what I calculated. I mean, it was literally by 
placing the size of the tables and the chairs that the club plans to use in those spaces in that space. And to a large extent, that determines the capacity for seating on those, those items. That's why we're entertaining conditions on the number of seats. So you are including those as conditions? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sure it's just not laid out not, in this table. Right. <coughs> I just want to make sure we're clear on that. The, the conditions that Brian put forth that we talked about at the club is try to <coughs> end by 9 o'clock outside, get inside. So we take care of that. And, and let's remember also events happen three months a year basically yeah. four months that's our season right so it's not 12 months a year right. people are only going to want to be out there certain months and that's going to be limited nine o'clock for any private function inside um, and then the, the other deck that's off to the, the smaller porch we condition that as lunch only and for noise purposes we've also said that we would be willing to put up some type of sound barriers to make sure that that didn't affect anybody during it. So we think that that is the intent of limiting the use of that and making sure that it's used for what we intend to do. Which basically, just so you all know, golfers finish around, I want to have lunch outside on a beautiful Sunday. Have lunch outside, you finish around the golf, sit down, chairs, rocking chair, that's what it's going to be used for the majority of the time. Will there be people outside for a function? Yes. Will you have a golf tournament where 50 people could be mingling outside? Yes. That's from 12 to 3 in the afternoon. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. I'm really not um, opposed to having both decks, both porches have the same time limits. I, I don't understand why we need to stop at 3. They're both equally far away from yeah. the street. We, 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 we did it, Mr. Chairman, we did it only because the intent of how we built it was for basically for lunch purposes, and that's why we, we said we'll, we'll put it there because there was some concern in our butters meeting about the sound of that then. So we feel comfortable saying that's the intent of how we built it, and we're comfortable. Okay. Yeah, to, 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 sorry, can I have your, your name, please? I'm Bob Morelli, the general manager at Melbourne. I've been there about 15 years, and uh, all those years with the old and the new deck, I can tell you that aside from an occasional tournament, it's never been built. Uh, most of the time, people come in from golf, 85 degrees out. The last thing they want to do is sit out on, in the sun and you just don't come in. There are a few that will sit outside, but I have never ever seen all through the 60s. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments regarding um, the issue of expanding the non-conforming use, character quality? Okay. Um, my name is Lindsay Baker on 236 Road Street. I um, just wanted to remind that um, this part of the street gets a lot of traffic impact because of the town forest and compost. So when you're considering the traffic study portion, um, you just keep that in mind. I'm very concerned with the project was the traffic and safety, and I know that the impact of use um, stated not to change, but the neighborhoods changed since the first clubhouse was built. And Town has grown, more people are using those facilities, and so it would be a good thing to address a lot of teacher tests that are going to get there for the safety. And it would be responsible. Thanks. Uh, TK Carroll, Station Grove Street, um, direct next to Meadowbrook. Um, you know, I, I'm in the construction business, I'm not, I'm not here to start any trouble, but I would, as some of the other neighbors are concerned, um, it is about traffic mostly for us and uh, safety of our kids out there. Um, it is busy. Um, now, if you increase <coughs> use by one occupant, I mean, technically you should have a traffic study done. Um, it will increase use and flow, uh, so therefore the traffic study should be done. Uh, now, unfortunately for Meadowbrook, as, as uh, my neighbor 
just said, we have the town forest. The traffic is terrible. And it's not all in Middlebrook. <clears throat> By any stretch of the imagination, if the town should really do something about the forest, that's the major issue. But to add traffic to an already bad traffic problem is the concern. <clears throat> that being said, um, you know, I understand that traffic study costs money and changing plans costs money and moving club like I'm not into that. We just want to we just want to know that you know that um, which we already know is basically confirmed on paper, I guess. Um, you know, and, and one thing I think that would help to circumvent the, the situation is <clears throat> up um, at the top of the road is to put a stop sign. I mean, that's a major problem. Um, people come flying over that hill and come down the hill and coast down the hill. They don't even touch their brakes, and it's not anybody else's. Right? You know, <clears throat> maybe Meadowbrook would be considered to sit a stop sign. A stop sign. A stop sign. Yeah. I mean, isn't there a stop, stop sign at uh, Frank? No, or it's a breakaway and, and a stop sign up there and stop. And There's a freeway, street. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, but it's it's only stop one way. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's a major problem. Stop I mean, I've said before. Stop going <coughs> On Franklin and on Grove going through, but not going south. Unfortunately, our concerns are now resting upon Meadowbrook. It's not just that. And, and I think that's so, one of the problems with the traffic study. Yeah, so. yeah. So, <laughs> right. So, so let's talk about a, a, a traffic study. So, typically, right? There's there's two things that, well, one thing that that a traffic study, as um, identified in our our regulations, does, and it's it looks at how many people come into this facility and how many people leave, and then where do those cars go? So, um, from from purely if 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 we Take the the right where we, we um, talked about how this isn't a substantial change in the use. Without a substantial change in the use, um, you know, therefore there's not really going to be a substantial change in the the traffic. That being said, I don't think anyone up here um, um, is saying that there aren't issues related to traffic on Grove Street, right? I, I, I get it. There's issues related to the town forest. There's issues related to the compost center. And I think there's, uh, and probably speed coming down that hill and the, narrow, the, the narrowness of Grove Street as it comes around um, and heads past the the around I don't know what's there but you, you know as it co comes around the corner um, <clears throat> people walking all of that sort of stuff there there's issues here a traffic study as defined in a site plan review doesn't get at all of those safety issues that are really I'm gonna say on the town to deal with um, they're really not on Meadowbrook um, in the sense that Meadowbrook traffic, um, uh, if, or I even I should put it this way, this ch change reconstruction of the country club of the building isn't going to necessarily, in my view, change the traffic enough that warrants a traffic study. I think there's some things that we might be able to do at the entrance just, that just that, that could the that could change things. Drive me because, like, I, I'm hardly ever home. If anybody knows mm -hmm. me, I work about 80 90 hours a week. I'm never, I'm never there, but I happened to be there at a certain point in time last weekend where there must have been a function of sun going on, and it was literally car after car after car after car for 10 minutes. And we're like, well, it must be like a function going on or something, you know, just to see during those that time, like, how much is actually derived from that. Uh, granted, like I said, it's not all Meadowbrook's fault, and I. It's, I, I honestly feel bad because then that it's on their dime to do this graphic study. Like, I'm, I'm in the midst of this, too. I get it. I think it would just help everybody to understand exactly what plays a part in it. And moving forward, you know, I would just simply and blatantly ask Meadowbrook, in, in, in all honesty, do they plan on developing down the street? My fear is I don't want to send the Grove Street to become the other end of the road street. Right, but that's not relevant here. <clears throat> and if that comes up before the town somewhere, somehow, if it's not just individual lots. I'm not saying it's I don't relevant. know anything about it. I don't know. I'm just trying to explain to the process that if... I understand, and I'm just trying to explain the process. If it's just individual house lots, 
it won't see anything, right? Because it won't. So if it comes in as an approval, I, I first will say that no one from Meadowbrook has spoken to me about this at all. So all I'm talking about right now is based on hearsay. Um, but if they do come forward with a plan that divides lots along Grove Street and all those lots have their own frontage, that can be done by an approval not required plan. And that is something that the CPDC has 21 days to endorse. And it does not require notification to abutters and it does not require a public hearing. Um, well, so the I've best seen, way to know about that. Seen the lots mapped out. It doesn't matter. Those are just individual house lots, individual I property owners have rights. Simple question. I know, and I'm just trying to explain to you that that kind of speculation doesn't even come before us almost. You so know, it's just basic. Amendment on your site plan, though, and, and I agree with what Julie's saying, and, and uh, there's no required notice, so I agree with that yeah. on a single lot, multiple, and our lots. But if, if you have a five acre parcel, you're approving the entire parcel, you're looking at buffet areas. If something is no longer a buffet area because it's a house lot, in your opinion, would that require an amendment to the special permit? Um, I'm not just, I don't know what that would get into. I'm just saying that if this continues to operate as a nine hole golf course, then there's no change in that use. So, so if you bring a site plan and a property owner... If the property owner has a million acres of land and only needs 10 of them to operate as their existing use dictates, then I don't see why they can't sell the other 999,000 acres of it. But, but it might be a change. But right, it might be a change. It might be a change and we don't know. We, we're not there. I mean, there's a lot of things that might happen and that's not what we're doing. We're, 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 we're looking at whether they're yeah. changing the use, and they are not. In my opinion, they're not. They are building basically the same building. It's a better building. It has much better features. Uh, is it flexible inside for what, how they want to use it? Yeah. It probably means that they'll have a lot smaller functions because it's much more flexible than that. As an architect, as a planner, that's what I see when I look at that plan. I see the ability to break it down into smaller sections, not just one big hall. But I don't see a significant change in the character and quality, if that's what we're going to base this on. Can I just, sorry, um, Saturday's event was a cross-country meet at the uh, town forest. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I think to John's point yeah. before, this is a totally valid concern for the town. And just from my limited experience on here, if we were to not waive the traffic study, have them do it, you would be just as frustrated with the results because of the way the traffic studies are done about the fact of one more incremental car, it's not gonna capture all those people going to the cross, cross country meet because that's part of the steady state. And so the steady state is what is the challenge here. And with the small, you know, what we've discussed, 184 to 200 in terms of this capacity load, it's not going to get you an uptick in any of these traffic changes between that and the steady state to put up any type of red flags. So this does provide a nice opportunity to create a very great argument for the town to look at traffic on that street. But, you know, there's multiple uses going on and Meadowbrook is one of them, you know, and that's part of being on Grove Street at the moment. So just to bring it to the Board of Selectmen and ask them to look at some traffic calming measures. Yeah, we can discuss it. At, we have an internal group of staff called the Parking Traffic Transportation Task Force, and we talk about issues like this every month. Um, so I can bring it up for a discussion at that next meeting and see if there's some measures that can be taken to try to... We probably can't reduce the number of cars that are on the street, um, but we might be able to put in some safety measures. I can't promise anything without a conversation, though. And I wanted to say before that the best way to know what the CPDC is going to be discussing is to subscribe to their agendas on the website. So um, like in the instance that we do receive an approval not required plan for property that Meadowbrook owns, um, it'll get put on an agenda and you'll, you can 
get that agenda emailed to you. That's probably the best way to know about that. Okay. <coughs> um, can we talk about loading, the loading space? Sure. Um, I guess my con I have a couple of concerns, but um, and, and I'm not sure how you might solve those if they need to be solved. Um, but so, right, the way the place you have you you're showing the the um, larger tractor trailer um, parking, right? I, that's awkward um, to to say the least. Because right, it's on a pretty good slope right there, a pretty good grade, um, and then it, essentially in the flow of traffic, and then when they pull out whatever it is that they're delivering, they're going to be, you know, dollying it, it, it back and forth. Um, so, um, and just sort of a. <laughs> To me, a suboptimal um, uh, solution. And maybe that's the only solution, but one I think that also um, sort of create may create as many um, traffic issues as it as it solves. I, I, I have two responses to that. Um, we're talking about the large tractor trailers yeah. coming yeah. into the site. That happens once or twice a week. It, or, or is that fair about once or twice a week? Um, historically, uh, from the existing loading area sketch that I provided to, mm -hmm. to the board, you can see where the existing tractor trailer parks. It's, it's very similar. Traffic from the upper lot can still get around it. It, it, it parks. It works. Historically, this is how they've done the drop-offs. Going back, mm -hmm. we're, we're almost mimicking that. It is on a slope. They would pull it onto the site. Then they would drive around the site to exit, turn around, come back onto Grove Street. So there'd be no unloading or loading on Grove Street itself. In the way that we show it, may not be ideal, but cars from the upper lot can still get by that tractor trailer truck. We're not prohibiting movements through the site. Um, we do have a dedicated loading space. That's what we're required. On the site plan, it's supposed mm -hmm. to be 10 by 35. We provide that for the smaller vehicles. But the question did come up how we did with the tractor drills, which is a not a, it, it doesn't occur that often, but we did want to demonstrate how it would be done. Historically, it's, it's very similar to what's being done now with the existing clubhouse. Jack, did you put turning movements on the plan? I did not. If I could, if I could add to Jack's comments, we ask all our vendors to deliver in box trucks. Uh, however, we're at their mercy if they have unusual shipping schedule, the dispatcher will send them out the truck. We have no control over that. So uh, sometimes they do park in a place that we don't want them to park. But as Mr. Powell said, it's pretty hard to argue with those guys. They're not going to be. <laughs> so, you know, we're kind of a little bit at that yeah. issue. That might be some parking for the fire department. Well, could you just help also see when we do see a large truck that's usually Monday through Friday in the morning, yeah. once or twice a week? Okay. Let's go. The guys that come regularly go up, way up, way the up. So they wear the coolers, they grab the topics, and they park right at the front door. It depends on the drive. Yeah. <clears throat> Can't we just pull it up to the side of the building there? Then it makes a left turn, a natural left turn around the, the, the parking and back out. If it's only a couple times a week, it's... I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, did you write? Sure. Did you write about the Yeah, right there. Yeah. 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 Right. Are you talking in this area, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Just park it there. That's why I was just talking to Kevin about why you were talking. So, sorry, Mr. Collins. Mm -hmm. yeah. the same thing. <laughs> yeah. it, it, right. it would, we could basically put put for the larger tractor trailers. They could park here. They'd still move around the site like they typically do. We showed it here just because the service bays over here when they wheel. We just thought it was easier having pulling off to the left an easier stop 
on the load because the, serve, the delivery decks are right down here into the bottom right. Get it in and get pumped. That, that, that was the thought of why we did it off the left hand side. Now I understand why it's closer to that loading entrance. I'm just saying if you, you pull the truck up to the side there, it still has good turning movements because it's going left, right? It's going to turn left up into the lot so the driver can see. And it doesn't cause any havoc down at the uh, at the entrance. Right. And if it really is only a couple times a week, it's I, I probably think, not going to. I think that sounds fine. fine. I just want to yeah. make sure that, but that sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. it, and if it's up there, and you do have that, you know, odd time situation with someone is coming up, they are going to wait in the street if they see one in the way, and they will pull in if they don't. So. Yeah. Okay, so we're okay with that. <coughs> yes. Just a quick question: There's a variety of trucks. There's obviously some tractor trailers. There's a lot of the small box trucks, and there's a lot of in between. Um, I don't know if you saw the photos, but my my question is: Can they make that sharp? The smaller trucks or the midsize trucks? Can they make that 90 degree turn into the circle and still navigate the circle to exit? Or are, are they going to be? Not my problem, I guess, but you know they're going to just have more trucks have to go out to drive and park on one side of the building. Uh, John, what size truck is shown in the in the space? There's a plan here that shows the vehicle in here. I assume it can make the turn. The plan shows the space, yeah, not right. the vehicle. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we had asked is to <coughs> is to have those turning movements so that well, we can see that it that trucks can get around that. Yeah, but there's a this is a thirty five foot. Space. Yeah, but I think the issue is being able to come from the driveway in the driveway you're on the right hand side of the driveway and taking that right turn you may end up having to take you may end up doing around the loop the wrong way um so you have the same problem exiting if you turn left right right well they could go up into the parking lot parking lot and then loop around Did, Jack, did you want to review your revised civil drawing? Yeah. Maybe that would be good. Sure. And if, okay. Do you think it's time? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Um, from the plans we submitted uh, to the board and did with some comments from the engineering department that came back, they, they wanted to eliminate the head-on parking out in front of the site that currently exists. And they, they saw a chance to increase the amount of green space while also making it more of a uniform width on Grove Street. Right now, this is the other side of pave, edge of pavement on Grove Street, opposite the clubhouse. And you can see how it's on a curve. The engineering department asked if I could mimic that curve here, expand the throat of the entrance here, create some additional green space and along, along the pavement limits, install vertical granite curbing to eliminate the ability for head-on parking in this area. So based on those comments, um, I came up with a design. I presented it to the town conceptually. This is not part of the set that you received, but um, th this would be something that's added to the design plans. Um, so th this would be a design feature shown here. It runs from the site entrance. There's a utility pole right here. The curbing would fit <coughs> into this utility pole in this spot. We also have vertical granite curbing on this side that I ended about here. And there's a catch base and a little further down gradient. The town engineer asked that I extend the curbing to just beyond this catch basin, which makes sense. You want to keep any surface flow along an established gutter line in two the receiving basin, so I'm fine with that comment. We went back and forth a little bit on how the drainage would be captured at the entrance to the site. Originally, if you remember going back, I had a trench drain across the full width. There was concerns that the water coming down would bypass that trench drain. There was a, I met with the engineer a second time a few months ago wanted a catch basin, but the last comment that came back is they'd like to see a trench drain as well. When I spoke to the town engineer, we thought it both would be best. Keep the deep sump catch basin, because any sediment coming off into a trench grate, there's no um, sump for collection of sediment. 
So we're looking to do a combination of a deep sump catch basin with a trench drain. We also provided catch basins up gradient to capture some of the runoff coming off the upper parking lot. So presently where we have no drainage controls and water just sheet flows out on the Grove Street, we've added a series of drainage structures trench drains, deep sump catch basins, a rain garden, as I stated in earlier on, just the infiltration system alone for the clubhouse, we satisfy stormwater requirements under the town by law, but based on comments and feedback from abutters, the town, we added these additional thresholds and the town engineer reviewed the drainage and thought it was acceptable at this point. So the, the major changes were the drainage at the entrance and the, con the configuration of the curb cut and how we're going to provide granite, cur granite curbing here and increase uh, green space. I, I guess I would only add to the statement about no head-on parking is that there shouldn't be any parking along that curve from the throat, from the entrance to the club down to just about the walkway, I guess. Or at least to that uh, 99, that 90 contour, which is that first one that starts to bulb out. Because <coughs> that's yeah. your sight line into what's going on. Out of the sight. Yeah, I guess that was one of my thoughts with this is that by, and I, I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but just a, a note that, yeah, putting, widening this out and putting up vertical granite curb um, essentially means that there really shouldn't be any parking in there, where before we were just concerned about the head-in parking. And I do know, right, there's a lot of people, yeah. people park there That's all the time. That's because um, the, the yeah, the, the head-on is something that we shouldn't do. Here. Right, all agree right. That. There are some spaces there out of 50-something years of people parking, parking there, there that yeah. they've yeah. used those spaces there. But they do, I will say, they do help us when we have a big event or something like that. And it's certainly available to us because it, it, I mean, there is no yeah. parking is permitted mm -hmm. on that side. So we, we were thinking the proposal what Jack has up there in the green, and then that allows a few spaces off to the right. I'm not saying there are spaces. They would be just how it yeah. is today. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, two questions, or maybe just one question for you. Um, so the trench drain, we had spoken a little bit before. Um, I guess my concern with the trench drain, I didn't see any details on it because I know you were back and forth on it. Um, but to spec out a trench drain that has the cover um, bolted down or um, fixed very well um, so that um, so that you don't get that banging and don't drive the neighbors crazy anytime that someone drives over. Yeah, so I think that's, I'll have that on the detail. I'm going to try to find a wider trench drain that what the concrete offers and it'll be bolted. So right. we, don't, we don't get that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not very familiar with the area. What's it going to look like as you're approaching on this drawing from the left? My concern is that if that curve is not well defined, well, I guess it doesn't matter because the drivers will be on the right side, so it won't be an issue of them bumping into the green space. That's right. Yeah. Right now, it's yeah. awkwardly wide. Yes. Yeah. Right. The I think everyone would agree either. with that. Walking across the street to yeah. go to the next home. And that was the idea. When cars come down this way, it'll force them to stay. It'll, it'll match the up with the other yeah. side. Mm -hmm. So, um, one thing I can't really tell uh, on the driveway there, I know it's marked out with the um, stone gates right now. Is that intending to be expanded at all? I'm just, I'm, I am looking at photos here that does not look like a truck and a car can pass each other neatly. Um, is there <coughs> any, you know, how large is that and is there a possibility of making sure that that 
you know, truly is a two car. I, I can't tell from it's just, well, you know, it's so expected at 24 foot entrance, which is more than uh, two full lanes of a truck, truck and a car, yeah, and a car. Yeah. The town allows a 24 foot wide curb cut, and that, that's what we're proposing. Okay. If you go wider than 24 <coughs> feet, you're yeah, supposed to go to the board of selectmen. Um, 24 is, is pretty standard for two way traffic. Okay. The existing entrance is probably slightly less than 24 with the snow pillars, so this will actually improve okay. that access for we, we need to the 24. Yeah, the existing one, the, the pillars are much closer to the current uh, building location. Right. So, it, and it's much less obvious that it is an entrance per se. Right. Any comments on the revised street line parking? I'm strongly in favor. <laughs> we want to make sure that we have a clear no parking boundary here. I mean, I, I well, really don't want to see any parking along that view. Yeah, curb line. It sounds like we we need some uh, enhanced enforcement at least uh, to, when, until people get used to the, the change in the roadway. Because the, the currently it's just this wide open, you know, wild west kind of corner. Understood, but I mean, the applicant can make sure that their their membership isn't parking there. But it's not right. You're allowed to park there. You're allowed to park there. Where you're allowed to park there today. You're allowed to park on Grove Street anywhere on Grove Street today, tomorrow, and when this is built. So it's not. A, it's not a town enforcement issue. Right. It's. Uh, I don't know. You know. Like I, I don't know how you address that. What I'm concerned with is that as you're coming south from the town forest, that if you park cars along this new green space, you're blocking the entrance. You're cutting yeah. back on a sight line. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You? You're, you're coming around. You can't see if someone's queued up there or if someone's going to come through. So if you leave it open, at least you can see that. Right. Uh, I mean, how many lengths? What's the length of that new curve there? I mean, I guess there should be no parking there, but I'm not sure how how this board stipulates no parking on what is a town roadway. We can't do that. We don't have that power. Uh, any old strips? <laughs> <laughs> it's about 60 feet in length, and the town engineer and I, when we spoke about this, with the vertical granite curving, that's a deterrent. Yeah. 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 Right. Unless you have a it's big. It's a deterrent for head on parking, but parallel parking. Even to get even to get up on the curb line. We were saying different. parallel parking next to it. Parallel along the curb. Yeah. 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 Well, how that's what wide I'm talking is about. the road? That's no on the entire length of Grove Street. Right. You have curbing, you have corners, and you have area, and people can park on Grove Street now legitimately. There's an entrance right. to a there's an entrance to a site right. there, though. That's what we talked about. So, so the point is, if you want to change the rules, you have to do the rules correctly. This isn't the place to discuss that. There's parking issues all on Grove Street, the entire length, curb or no curb. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. Yes. Saying I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. We're doing a site plan review. There's an entrance to a, a facility here, There's and you're blocking on its Grove view. And you, and you lose your sight lines on every driveway when somebody parks on Grove Street. You're bringing up an issue. You don't have 50 cars coming out of a yes, you do. driveway. I, I, out of a driveway. I live on. I live you have on a 50 Grove car Street. driveway. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I live on. Grove I'm going to have the actual people, people park. Here. They park on the curbs. They park on the sidewalk. They park everywhere. If you're going to enforce parking, Let's move on. Or come up with rules for parking, you need to do that. But you cannot bring that up in this meeting. It's not appropriate. Uh, I think it is. We can bring it up. Okay. Can Certainly I ask can. you a question? How wide is Grove Street, the paved portion? In this section, it, it was really wide. I tried to narrow No, I mean, like, once you narrow it. Like once I narrow it, 28, 28 feet. Okay. I mean, the narrowing of it is a disincentive to park along there in any way, shape, or form. People don't want their cars to get hit, but it's not that People narrow. People are lazy. And they'll park as close to the entrance as they can. And I'm telling you that they're going to block that sight line on the corner. Now, you're telling me that there's speed issues on this roadway, and we haven't implemented any traffic calming yet. The curb might. This might that do a little help. bit of it. But if you start blocking the entrance, then I think we're defeating the purpose of trying to sort of. I mean, we can we up. can stipulate that Meadowbrook cannot let 
It's patrons park on Grove Street. Well, that's what I'm suggesting. You can do that. And then we'll have to look at the uh, your PTTFD. Yeah. You, you can also require the applicant to go in front of the selectmen. And, and if, uh, the, if your buyers have a function, they want to park on Grove Street. That doesn't handle the just cannot that. control people's parking. And it's not only a club. If they get it, you know, you can't require yeah. them to obtain that, but you could require them to go I mean, and try. I think they want that. But you could, I mean, because that we can enforce if we get calls from neighbors that there's golfers parking along Grove Street. We, we can say, look, your site decision says that you were going to tell your you know, members not to park on Grove Street. Uh, members and guests. Right. Anyone using the Meadowbrook facility, yeah. That's, that's what so That I would be one way. Well, that's what I'm proposing. Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Could I, could I just ask to make sure I understand what the issue is before we solve? Where is, if Jack can point that red thing, where is your concern on the parking on Grove Street? Right it's basically, there? yeah, it's basically along that length there. Right, so so that that doesn't make sense. Like, you, you couldn't park there. Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't park. Right, you could, <laughs> but, but, but right, but we all know people. No, I, I think people will. But but just just if we if I, I know, but if we today that Jeff just above that uh, green stick is it? Can I stand up, please? Mm -hmm. I'm terrible. So yes, yes. This is this is today where there's a a wall or the property line here, Jeff. Right, right, right. Property line. Yeah. Okay. We have the cars parked today. They'll come in head on here, mm -hmm. and then they'll park parallel here, up against the wall. Right? This is going to deter the head on parking here, right. which I think is the right thing to do. We'll all agree. This here is an opportunity to the side of Grove Street where people park today. This, I don't see how that's an issue because it's allowed, as one of the guests here said, it's allowed all along Grove Street. And that's the only thing. We, we don't think this makes, like it's possible even to park a car here and get allow traffic to get down. But we do think that it's reasonable to park here where we've been parking for 50 years without any incidents. That, that's in parallel because putting the, um, uh, what would you say, gr uh, granite? granite? Granite here will deter anybody trying to go face in parking. I am concerned for the town because this is an area where they dump snow and that could be challenging for that. So I hope we all thought that part through. But if that's what the engineering department thinks, then that eliminates the thing that head on parking. And we would say to our membership, no head in parking. And no parallel parking in that area either. Yeah, I mean, green is. this this here. Um, where the green is. Yeah, this is the, right, right there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Th this here. Right. Yes. That's we. That's what we've been parking. Yeah. You just don't have very many spaces. There. You only have three, four, five, six spaces. Yeah. Exactly. With the green. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Anything else from the board on parking? So uh, I'm not for any parallel parking on that. If we have to condition it any way we can, I guess. I mean, the, really, the only power you have would be to, to have them um, not allow their members to park there. You don't have any power to like establish regulations for Grove Street. Correct. But you can regulate the applicant. We could, uh, and we could ask the PTT mm -hmm. to, talk, to about talk about it. Yep, we'll talk and, about it. And it's different here at this little stretch if we put vertical granite curbing because nowhere else on granite on Grove Street is there granite vertical granite curbing. Even the new section that we built that we didn't build vertical granite curbing, we put um, Cape Cod berms in. When was that? Uh, a couple of years ago. There is at the beginning of the row street on the right hand side and people park on the sidewalk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How do we move forward on uh, the bigger issue? Because we have to um, make a motion to vote on each of those issues. Well, wait a second. How's this decision written here? The decision is written as though 
that issue was accepted as part of the decision. The decision needs a lot of work, actually, okay. given all the stuff we've talked about and the new information that we've gotten. Um, you don't disagree with that? Uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. You agree that it needs work? Thank you. I agree with you. Yeah. That, uh, we presented some yeah. issues tonight that uh, really were contemplated by the planning staff as yeah. part of that uh, existing draft decision. Right, Julie? Right. <clears throat> um, so, do we need to continue the hearing? I guess so. Were there, there any close of the public hearing? And um, I was going to say, if no one has any objections to what we've all agreed to tonight, it just has to be incorporated in a decision. I'd rather have you look at something before you vote. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't going to vote mean, on this. No. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to yeah, close the public hearing and vote next time? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. We have to close the public hearing? What if I mean, you don't have to. to. I don't think we should. I think people should be allowed to look at the decision. Right. In its final I just form. I thought that's what you had said. What John had said. That's what I was trying to get to. Okay. So do we have a continuing, continuance target? I would say 745 next time. Yeah. In case Johnson Woods doesn't happen again. Yo, uh, what's our date? November 5th. <laughs> we already put them at 7.30. <laughs> Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for the site plan review uh, of Meadowbrook Golf Club until Monday, November 5th at 7.45 p.m. Second. All in favor? Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, wow. Second, yet four. And then since then. And Tony, but Tony always works. 